just have to read it like this. A feeling? I'll try. Okay. Um. Uh, greetings. Uh, welcome to You'll Only Listen Twice, our unauthorized and illegal podcast where we discuss the James Bond films, both official and unofficial. This is official. Y yes. Uh, uh, well, I have to read this. Uh, Mr. McClory says I have to read this. Uh, most of the films we have covered are the unofficial ones illegally created by Eon Productions without the express consent of Kevin McClory, sole creator of James Bond, Spy Cinema, Duck Dodgers, The Air We Breathe, The Water We Drink, among others. What is that? Okay. Oh, I am, insert name here. Oh, oh. I am Jake. I am, insert name, oh shit, Troy. I am Jan. I won't make a quippy remark this time because this movie deserves better. It's the best one we've seen so far. I I, I think we all would agree, right? Yeah. I'm, right, I right? Mean, yeah. Absolutely. They released it in the fall for Oscar contention for a reason. Yes, indeed. We are also joined by producer Paul. Hello. Of course. My name's producer Paul. I remember my name. Did you know this is the first James Bond movie ever nominated competitively for a Golden Globe? Yes, because it's the best one. That wonderful ceremony that's still going. Because there, <laughs> nothing says artistic integrity like the Golden Globes. Some Indeed. people would say that Kevin McClory bribed the Hollywood foreign press. Those people are dirty liars, allegedly mm -hmm. sent by the likes of Albert Broccoli to smear his good name. Yes. And today is a special episode. After much anticipation, we are finally taking a look at Mr. McClory's greatest triumph. A film that will go down in the annals of film history as a masterpiece of the art form. A film uninhibited by the iron grip of United Artists, Albert R. Broccoli, and Harry Seltzman. An independently produced work of genius that is only possible through the sheer grit and determination that only someone like Mr. McClory possesses. Yes, of course, we at You Only Listen Twice are talking about Never Say Never Again. Never, never say never again. Never, oh, just never the title. Say never. Gives me goosebumps, man. Like, this not being nominated for the Oscars will go down as one of the biggest Oscar flubs, along with not giving Citizen Kane the Oscar. Even bigger, in my opinion. I mean, look at the pedigree of this movie. You have Irvin Kirshner, Michelle Legrand, uh, Sean Connery, Kim Basinger, Max von Sydow, Klaus Maria Brandauer, Lorenzo Semple Jr. Surely all these talented people working together could not make something bad. And no, they didn't. of course not. No. Who would say They that? made something fantastic. For me personally, there aren't enough stars in the heavens to award this cinematic triumph. This is easily a one billion stars out of five for me. To say yeah. nothing of Sean's... I, I don't even think it's a toupee. I think Kevin McClory, praise and blessings be upon him, uh, gave him a full head of natural hair. Like, we can't even rate the toupee because there isn't one there. We're just seeing Sean's... Air. I mean, Sean Connery's performance is a highlight. Like, it's his career best. Never Say Never Again's vision of Bond is a human bond. A bond that ages and shows that our heroes aren't immune to the passage of time. Something that gets it to the heart of what the character that Kevin McClory created is all about. Wait, what? Wait, you need to go to the bathroom? Like, right now? Well, we're, we're recording. Okay, yeah, we'll just sit here and wait, you know? Okay. Well, it, it looks like uh, Kevin's going to the bathroom for a bit, so... Uh, oh, thank God, this was such a piece of fucking shit. Jake, Jake are you okay? <laughs> yeah, no, I think I think we're okay for now. I think we have an, a good uh, two hours before he comes back. So. Oh, okay. okay. C 06100, that's my postal code. Come come get me, please. I, I We're being held hostage by a gun. This man is crazy. And guys, you don't get it. Jan has so many stalkers already that you know he's in trouble when he's broadcasting his coordinates. <laughs> he's more afraid of where he's at than what might be coming for him. 
why, 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 am, why am I even saying this? I know that Kevin's all just going to bleep this out anyways. Right. I'm sure whatever we say will just be bleeped and this won't be released unfiltered. Yeah. Producer Paul, you need Bleeps to online. you need to help us out with this one. You need to get us out of this jam. This is your greatest test. Guys, guys, this is Kevin McClory's podcast. We can't refer to him as Producer Paul anymore, remember? He's executive fun friend Paul. And our real producer is baby Jason Schwartzman. Oh. Uh, right. <laughs> Only as a baby. Is he is he a baby in this? He was uh, at the well, time. Well, no, but he's the son of Jack Schwartzman, the producer, and husband to Talia Shire, which is why his production company is called Talia Film. And in the credits, Talia oh. Shire is credited as, like, special producer's assistant. The credits of this movie are fucking wild. <laughs> when, I was, when the movie was done, I'm looking at all the people who worked on it. Because they had, like, Michael Moore, the guy who was the second unit director of Temple of Doom... They had a different Michael Moore. Different Michael Moore. Not <laughs> are we sure? Not other Michael Moore. Are we I'm sure? sure. I'm yeah, I was going to say this. This movie is not like uh, radical liberalism propaganda. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, but Vic Armstrong is there too. He did the stunts for the later official Bond movies, and also was working on Indiana Jones. So a lot of uh, there's like a mini Barry Lyndon reunion. Yeah. One of the greatest composers of the 20th century uh, does one of the worst scores. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Oh yep. my fucking God. Don't don't get me started on that Michelle fucking score. Oh my God. It's so Very bad. much like O.K. Yeah. Connery. <laughs> <laughs> well, O.K. Connery. Well, Ennio Marconi still delivers a serviceable score. This is like embarrassing. Wait, the movie where he has like people singing like cats as they're yeah, like the meow, meow, hijacking meow a bus. Is better. <laughs> it's better than like, like this is like the score to like a screwball comedy from the 50s or something yeah, like that. Yeah, and it weirdly, is... Michelle Legrand admirably picks the completely wrong musical choice in every scene, and it's almost impressive, like how it does it's, not match. It, I could not believe uh, in the scene where the light, they're like at the fort and he's riding a horse and yeah, the music. I don't even know how to describe it. It's just like, if you, it, it, that's when I was like, okay, this is a fever dream. This is not a real any, movie. Any James Bond movie where the villain has to walk around with a boom box to explain why the music seems hilariously out of place, you're generally uh. not doing well. <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, Klaus Maria Brandauer. Fun fact about Klaus Maria Brandauer. Uh, I did an NYU summer program oh. um, for one month. I know, I know. I'm a Look fancy rich boy. So uh, fancy. Wow. Humble brag. Wow. Fucking Jen just flaunting. Yeah. I did a summer program at NYU and was Okay, was okay. I went to New York and I stood outside of NYU. Is that what you wanted? And I, with a camera and I were pretended. You, were you protesting you hippie? You can't win with these people. <laughs> 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 so during that one month that I was in New York, the building that I was staying, there was, we had this neighbor that would play loud German music all the time. And one time I had to get up early and I got fed up. I knocked on his door, and it was Klaus Maria Brando. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, wait, what? Oh. Yes. Oh this no. Is, <laughs> this is a real story, and I and I said, oh did my he, god, did he, get, did he get so angry that he started, like, breaking all the mirrors with an axe? <laughs> After he was he was drunk off his mind and it was extremely uncomfortable. But I was still like, oh my god, you're Klaus Maria, like you're Mephisto, one of the greatest actors yeah. of all time. And he was like, what do you want? And then I was like, can you turn the music down? He was like, nah, I can't do that. And and I was like, okay, fine, I'm not gonna argue with you. And he closed <laughs> the door. And then uh, I just I just said under my breath, fucking never say never again. Fucking motherfucker. <laughs> like, I was, <laughs> that was my comeback. <laughs> Never turn down the music again. Yeah. Every single time uh, Largo was blasting his tunes, that must have really hit you personally. I know. I, it, it really brought me back to a bad time, yeah. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> What do you what do you saw him with the boombox when Kim Basinger is about to be sold? You're you're just like, oh god, and you had like chills going up your spine. 
<laughs> yeah, and then I found this room in the apartment that had this, like, glass that looked into Klaus Maria Brandauer's apartment, and I saw him dancing as he <laughs> played the music. It was, that was weird. <laughs> Ironically, I had a very similar experience with Max von Sydow in his Mario Kart tournament he played in an apartment next to mine. <laughs> <laughs> this is right before the pandemic. So I, I, you know, I killed him. <laughs> nice. He deserved it. Congratulations. He just barely, Sean Connery outlived uh, Max von Sydow by a couple months. So who has the last laugh? Two uh, revered actors who both looked very old for a long time. Oh yeah, no, those are two. Well, Max von Sydow always looked old. Like his hair is white in the seventh seal and he's like 15. Right. Movie. And Sean Connery just like when he turned 40, he looked like he was 65 and he just looked like 80 for the rest of his life. Maybe he drank from the wrong grail and he aged 20 years <laughs> like in a second. Maybe. I I think Kevin McClory, like he met him on the set of Thunderball and then he just sucked all the youth out of his hand. And he's like, ah! <laughs> Why are you doing a, a, a breastfeeding motion with your hands? <laughs> No, this is the sucking hand motion. No, this is the I'm breastfeeding you like you're sucking my tits. Wow, Jan, you really seem to be an expert on the breastfeeding motion. You know who else was an expert in boobs? Klaus Maria Brandauer. No, I was going to say Kevin McClory and the creative team behind Never Say Never Again. Yeah, so yep. tell us how this, like... Yeah, let's just spy, It's not it. a movie, it's a yeah. spy project, but tell us how it comes to be. <laughs> so, yeah, we've talked about it in the Thunderball episode, like the origins of Kevin McClory's uh, never-ending feud with Ian Fleming and Eon Productions. <laughs> oh, shit. Here we go again. So uh, they wrote Thunderball as a script, and then Ian Fleming took it and then made it the novel Thunderball. Kevin McClory got mad and sued him, and so he owned part of the rights to Thunderball. And so Eon Productions had to get in league with Kevin McClory to make Thunderball in 1965. It's a big hit. Kevin McClory is not allowed to pursue any other adaptions of Thunderball for a period of 10 years. 10 years comes up and he tries to make it. I think we this came up in the Spy You Love Me episode where uh, Kevin McClory was first trying to uh, mm -hmm. do this project. I think he filed an injunction against Eon Productions because they thought that The Spy You Love Me was too similar to his script at one point. Then lawsuits up the wazoo throughout the late 70s. It doesn't get made. He's trying to pitch it around to studios and nobody wants to touch it because it's a legal nightmare. <laughs> and so finally, an entertainment lawyer by the name of Jack Schwartzman, who was an executive at Lorimar Pictures, he had just uh, quit his job and he's like, Kevin, I'm going to do business with you and let's make this movie together. And so Jack Schwartzman's big idea was that he was going to get like money from three different banks and a bunch of other studios so that if any sort of financial backing fell through, the movie would still keep going. <laughs> so nice. Uh, they were able to get Sean Connery to come back. Originally, he just wanted to like write the script, right? Uh, I think he wanted. Yeah, he wanted, I, I guess, more creative control and also more money. And they he got a hefty payday. The sum of five million dollars for this movie, which and a is of the gross. current terms is nine million dollars. You know, Kevin McClory originally, like before he asked Sean, he uh, he wanted a younger, fresher Bond, so he asked uh, Richard Burton. Oh yeah, <laughs> for context, of course. listeners, Richard Burton died a year after this movie. Came out. <laughs> yeah. Oh my I mean, God. he even in Exorcist <laughs> 2, he looks like on the brink of death. Yeah, he was not doing that <laughs> yeah. for a while. But Kevin no, this was the this was the time I guess where like they hadn't figured that that James Bond could just be younger and no one would care. They were like canonically James Bond is sixty five. <laughs> this is how he has <laughs> right. to stay. Yeah. Like, it's like we we have to. It wouldn't make any sense if it was a younger person. Well, at the, actually, no, they, I take that back because they were they were testing younger actors yeah. and George Lazenby was younger than Sean Connery. Yeah, but well. I mean, in the in the mind of the populace at the time, James Bond was just an old guy at this point because we had <laughs> not one, two of them and they were both old as shit. 
I yeah, feel right. like Kevin McClory would never. It feels wrong for Kevin McClory to make a movie about a young James Bond because Kevin McClory's movies are all about Kevin McClory, and Kevin McClory was not a young man at the time of this. <laughs> no, 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 no. You know he was an actor at one point. Of course he was. <laughs> I'm sure he was of the greatest actor. And I actor bet he was a generation. great actor. I bet he, he was right. the greatest the actor, actor who ever knew. He actually he inv- he invented he invented the concept of acting. I think. Yeah, before Kevin McClory, people just Method read was all scripts. him. It was just <laughs> yeah. Le- Le- Lee Strasberg Lee Strasberg, just copied him. Fuck him. Stella Adler. Fuck her. Stanislavski. A myth didn't even exist. Look it up. <laughs> Look, it Look it up. up. Kevin McClory. It's Kevin McClory. The, it's it's just Kevin. Um, yeah, what's what's actually shocking to me about this movie is that I read that like Sean Connery had a bunch of input on the script yes. and mm-hmm. he kept like rewriting it and hiring new writers and people to look at for sight and he was never satisfied with it. And then you watch the movie and you're like, this is just Thunderball and whatever changes they made are the most insane nonsensical like non-story changes that you could ever imagine there is some good changes that go back to the original book i would argue but we'll get to yeah but speaking of changes apparently this is a shock to no one this movie had uh, some big production problems <laughs> what what yeah. in a kevin mcclory movie <laughs> oh yeah no Wait, but jack schwartzman was such an experienced producer well <laughs> Uh, Sean Connery would later claim that him and the assistant director were the only ones producing the movie, <laughs> which goes to show how good of a relationship he had with Jack Schwartzman. <laughs> they filmed in France. They filmed in Nassau. Apparently, they had to shoot shut down production for weeks because there was a monsoon <laughs> that came in and they couldn't film anything. Oh, and also Jack Schwartzman said that Irvin Kirshner, quote unquote, took his time, meaning he was very, very slow to get to get everything done and then even after all of this they had to go back and reshoot things because it wasn't working and i'm still not convinced that they fixed the movie the movie is fucked (laughs) yeah i was gonna say like what (laughs) like oh and also uh talia shire apparently she was pregnant at the time and yeah and apparently she used uh her salary from rocky three to help fund this movie oh uh, wow. Apparently she would, she complained going like, I didn't realize like how backstabby everybody is alluding to Sean Connery's behavior on set. Apparently. Oh, was he an asshole during this? Well, wait, wait, are you telling me Sean Connery was an asshole? Well, on, <laughs> if you're looking at, at it from the Jack Schwartzman side of things, then yes. But I think in Connery's mind, he was going like, no one knows what they're doing. This is unprofessional or. Yeah. We, we got to just make this. And then at the end of filming, he said, this felt about as long as all six of my earlier Bond movies put together, <laughs> which shows just the kind of experience he had on this movie. <laughs> In the end, was it was it an enjoyable experience for you, recreating Bond? Um, <clears throat> it should have been a great deal more pleasure than it was. Um, but it's unfortunate that yet again, one has had to carry some incompetent. Yeah, I I, th- I think he had a point, to be fair. Yeah. This movie is really an all-hands-on-deck situation. Apparently, the screenplay is credited to the creator of Batman 1966 and the screenwriter of Flash Gordon, Lorenzo Sanchez And Jr. King Kong 1976. And King Kong 1976. But apparently, Talia Shire's brother, Francis Ford Coppola, uh, did uncredited rewrites. <laughs> Oh my god! As well. Wow! Yeah. Um, this is just like a Casino Royale situation all over just, again. Just, yeah. Everyone and their mother working on this. This yeah. movie actually is probably if if the 1967 Casino Royale had gotten Sean Connery, it probably would have been like this movie. It, yeah, probably. Yeah. Yeah. You 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 have Sean Connery, which in theory could be nice. In theory, that could be everything. Like, Barbara Carrera turned up Octopussy, one of the greatest movies ever made. She turned it down. To, <laughs> I mean, I, yeah, I don't know about that. I think, like, it could be nice if you really went for the he's an elderly spy angle, but, like... Well, that's the problem with this movie. Okay, 
So here's the thing. The first 40 minutes of this movie aren't bad. Yeah, I would agree with that. It's actually pretty good. It's actually taking the character into an interesting direction. They're going like, okay, what if there's like this older Bond and the world has moved past him in the spy shenanigans of the 60s and he has to deal with it and also grapple with being older. It's alluded to. Yeah, no, like in the beginning, they they raise these points and there's a fun action scene with... Was that Pat Roach? Mr. Bean. Magic. Oh, yeah. Well, Mr. Bean comes with the movie, like, dies. I but, would like, say Mr. Bean <laughs> is where the movie dies, actually. Yeah, no. Uh, when, when he steps <laughs> Don't, don't call NASA, Mr. Bean at 3 a.m. to be on your... <laughs> to be Bond in movie. your, in your unofficial Bond movie. Don't call Mr. Bean at 3 a.m. in general, but especially... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you need him to be in your Bond movie. <laughs> guys, on today's video, we are going to be calling Mr. Bean, guys. Come on. Hello? Oh my god, is this Mr. Bean? Oh my god, I don't know what to say right now. It was actually Mr. Bean. The first 40 minutes, it's it's like, okay, this is actually not, not bad. This is this is fun. And then the movie just dies because then it becomes Bond goes to a place. Like the entire Nassau part of the movie is completely pointless he learns nothing there the action scenes are whatever like him about to be eaten by the shark oh. and then everything else after that is just like off-brand like bad spy movie crap with no direction and terrible music no come on he becomes a gamer that's fun i mean that's that, yeah. and they completely drop the <laughs> the the idea of bond being this older spy like it doesn't come back into the movie at yeah, all. Spoiler alert, listeners, it's Thunderball. They did it again. And the whole point about Thunderball, I thought, was James Bond comes into this world of old people with very young women, and suddenly he's the young guy who's taking it over. But now in this movie, everyone's younger than James Bond. So it becomes this old guy coming into these messed up young people, drug ballet addicts, and getting and video involved games. in their shit. And video games. It, even <laughs> even the arcade thing, as strange it is, as it is, could be like something where it's just like, okay, Bond is out of his depth here. No. Yes. The, 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 the world has moved on. Now they're playing That's fucking uh, Centipede and shit. Guys, I'm going to so, say it here. James Bond going to a black tie formal where... They play Galaga. And Centipede. <laughs> There's no way to salvage it. I can totally see the logic of like Irin Kirshner and uh, Kevin McClory of being like, yeah. well, Bond is is like a gamer because he likes to play games at the casino. What's the modern version of that? Right. <laughs> no, that's exactly what they were thinking. This whole movie yeah. is trying to show up Eon. It's trying to have more violence, more sex, and trying to be hipper than Eon but then you realize if you don't do that whole timeless fairy tale quality of the Eon productions at the time, this just comes out kind of trashy. Well, I'll take it a step further. Like, it's it's not the timelessness or anything, like, because every single Bond movie kind of feels outdated, but then it's supplanted with a new thing where they try to keep up with the times and stuff. But at least the Roger you have... Moore ones, especially like every movie is just a reaction to the last one. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So that's perfectly normal to me. I don't think that's the issue. It's just like the issue is, is that it's trying to be like the James Bond, the official ones, but without any of the things that make the official James Bond movies, James Bond movies. You, you don't have a gun barrel. You don't have an opening Maurice Binder sequence. You don't have the theme. You don't have any of the legally defining things that make a James Bond movie a James Bond movie besides Sean Connery. And when you have that, those detriments, it's like, okay, what do you do to make it something that a regular Bond movie can't do? It's just like, oh, James Bond is now 50 years old and he has to deal with changing times. And you could do like some sort of cool thing or like make a movie about how, ah, the old guard, ah, the old kind of spying is is fun and it doesn't do any of that it just addresses those things and then grafts itself to being a straight remake of thunderball without anything new or interesting or fun <laughs> yeah it just feels like a bad random 80s that movie that was the term of the court case was it had to be a straight remake of thunderball without anything yeah. interesting or fun <laughs> though i mean i don't know like it's interesting like we talk about how this movie doesn't have the trademark james bond stuff but most of those trademarks are in like the first four minutes, the rest of the movie 
it's dying on its own. Well, that's the thing. Yeah. I was gonna. I mean, we thought yeah. we we're gonna get into our hot takes, but yeah, I was kind of like, it's pretty much the formula minus like the opening and the score, you know. But it's pretty much the formula, right? Yeah, I, I mean, mean, there's a reason most people think it is like, an official. There's monster. maybe <laughs> like in the Bahamas, there's like slightly less um, cause and effect than you get in some yeah. of the later Roger Moore movies. But in the uh, Ob- with the Obamas. What did you say? Jen, uh, Kevin McClory can come back from taking a shit at any point. We got to get Yeah, <laughs> this is the, the clock is ticking. <laughs> I'm sorry for We got to talk about the plot to this movie, which is Thunderball. Well, yeah, but like Yeah, we've <laughs> talked about it. It's unique. It's Thunderball. Do we need to just die? Wait, in? uh, Paul, what, I I wanted you to finish your point because Oh, well, yeah, I mean, that it's, I mean, obviously because it's Thunderball, like, and in many ways, I, you know, Thunderball kind of set the mold or was, was one of the pivotal ones in, in setting the Eon mold, they stick with that. And I mean, I haven't, having not read the book, we know that a lot of these movies heavily change what's in the books, like, and, and change right. the emphasis of them. So it's interesting that, you know, for the most part, it does kind of, keep the format well it, it not it not only keeps it it improves it because oh, this movie doesn't have an opening scene and then an opening sequence it combines them into this yes. beautiful synthetic scene <laughs> it bears no similarity this opening scene bears no slim similarity to the living daylight the Broccoli's in no way would steal this kind of thing and adapt it for their own reason. Despite wars. Five years later. No, no, no. Uh, Troy, we're being sponsored by Kevin in this one. Oh, you're right. We're being sponsored by Kevin sponsored. in this one. We can, we can say like that they're a rat. Point. Yeah. Those dirty Broccoli's ripped this movie off because they can't stop stealing Kevin McClory's hard work, obviously. Right. Those fucking rats. Who played the first Bond villain? Cubby hey, Broccoli. <laughs> Jan's got his magnifying glass out. He's going to catch the broccolis where they are. I will find them out. And <laughs> no, I won't. I won't do any of For this. listeners at home, Jan just brought out a magnifying glass and I'm not sure why. I just had it. <laughs> that's, that's a classic James Bond. He's always looking at clues. <laughs> yeah, he's a spy. He's like Sherlock Holmes, right? <laughs> Jan, Jan normally has like silly putty that he's playing with, but today it's a giant magnifying glass. Well. Today we're gonna investigate why this movie yeah, sucks. Yeah, so you're gonna need a magnifying yeah. glass because that's what. Okay, like studio logos, right? This was originally a Warner Brothers release. Well, in the United States, it was initially distributed by Warner Brothers, and I forget who distributed it internationally. Funny note: before we get into this, the copy that I had as a kid, I had a DVD copy of this. It was bought by MGM outright. <laughs> that's so cool. You, you must have gotten all the pussy. <laughs> Your parents really loved you, bro. Oh, I was so cool because <laughs> I had my DVD copy of Never Say Never Again. And also the DVD case had no MGM logos. No. Nothing indicating that it was an MGM they, release. They don't. I think That's why it, they ju- it just had a giant picture of Kevin McClory giving a thumbs up. I think it was the broccoli saying, like, I want you to make this as distinct from our James Bond like DVD box set as much as possible. Don't even say that's an MGM thing. And when the movie starts, it has like the nineties Orion. Yeah, pictures they, logo. they gave it to Orion. Oh, that's right. To yes, cover yes, it yes, up. That's yeah. what I saw. But Orion never okay, made but it. But basically the first thing you see after the logos. Little bitty 007s. <laughs> yes, I they get closer and closer re- and closer. To, it's like the magnifying class. It, I was like, is this a TV screen? You know, is this yeah. like pixels? But no. Right. Little 007s. Oh, it's it a, turns it's out aggressive. later at the end of the sequence that they are watching the whole opening sequence on the TV screen. True. Well, look, yes. that's just that's just a great director at work, Irving Kirchner. Yeah, you, know? you know, some people say... When we went to film school, I guess I'll bring this up now. Uh, when we went to film school, it was very fashionable to say that Irving Kirstner and Lawrence Kasdan were the people who actually really made Star Wars great and that George Lucas was just a hack. But now having seen more of Irving Kirstner's films, such as this and RoboCop 2, um, <laughs> mm, no, I don't agree well, with this. I, I, <laughs> my hot take is that Irving Kirstner's a ha- hack. Lawrence Kasdan's a hack. 
George Lucas is a hack. They're all hacks, and Star Wars is bad, and this movie is bad. <laughs> oh no! Uh, well, oh my that, god! You're going down a path I can't follow. Sorry that I'm criticizing Muppets in Space for grownups. <laughs> Muppets in Space would not have been possible if it wasn't for Frank Oz losing his virginity on the set of Empire Strikes Back. You take that back, young man. <laughs> oh my god! He lost his virginity to Yoda. <laughs> No, he was Yoda. That that wouldn't well, count. Well, he had to put his hand up somewhere. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he, he saw the puppet and had a hole, and I imagine you're lonely in the shop. Let's let's talk about the movie. Please get me out of here. <laughs> Please stop. Okay, instead of a gun barrel, we have a bunch of, a million 007 logos that zoom up. Let me go through one, and we're in the movie, and Bond is infiltrating a base. Yeah. That's pretty much it. <laughs> Some sort of South American... But it's base. set to the best music of all time. A music that we've never used in this podcast before. Never so yet. we'll play it for you listeners right now. It's, it's life-changing. Um. I hate this song. <laughs> it goes like bread and butter with what's happening. He's... Oh yeah, mowing down San Sandinistas <laughs> with a machine gun, <laughs> <laughs> and Michelle Langratzko is like, "And I love you." <laughs> it reminds me of the scene of Dick Tracy. You know, in Dick Tracy, where Madonna is singing more, and Dick Tracy's <laughs> yeah. like punching five guys with yeah. one blow. That's yeah. basically what this is. So as yeah. you can guess by that comparison, I love this song. <laughs> you love this song? <laughs> oh, I, this is actually the Bond song I listen what? to the most. Wait, I'm, this isn't Kevin's gun. Wait, talking. are you fucking kidding me? Please song. tell me this is a bit. No, I know Bonnie Tyler didn't like this song. That's why she didn't record it. But this is this is a bop. Troy, what Fuck are you doing? Man. You just had this is the a man terrible who says song. Never. You had me on your team last time. Like, what are you doing? Oh, I, there's gonna be some hot takes. This oh my <laughs> fucking goodness. Are you fucking kidding? This, no, this is <laughs> one of the worst fucking songs no, I've ever heard. This is fantastic. It's so Lenny weirdly. It. What's fantastic about it? It's mid, but it's better than several of the canonical ones. It does sweeping music. A man who, a man who says never, and then it gets very like staccato. Never. Never say never again. Never, Troy. never say never again. It builds. Troy, we just played it for I know audience. that we like Michelle Legrade. Dude, <laughs> fuck Michelle Legrade in this movie. No. Umbrellas of Schaberg can kiss my ass. This, this is fucking This is his best work, but Young shit. Girls of Rochefort has bought so much goodwill. And will you agree at least that what's happening on screen does not match at all the tone of this song? But that's what makes it funny. <laughs> it's, it's Kubrickian jam. It's Kubrickian. Oh God! <laughs> Shut the fuck up! Oh my up. God! Paul, Paul's Paul's on the Troy cult on this episode. Oh no! Oh no! Paul's <laughs> fuck me. <laughs> There's always one. It's like I always have one. <laughs> uh, but the most bizarre thing, which I literally stopped and rewound the movie a couple of times because I looked away and then I came back and I was like, oh, Sean Connery's on screen. Assuming that there would be some moment where, you know, this actor that is the whole selling point of this movie has a big entrance or something. No, they, no, just, cut, just, they just cut to him obscured behind the trees. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, you see his eye, uh, like, behind the trees, you're just like, oh, shit, here he comes. And then the next scene is just him punching a guy. <laughs> and that's it. And you it's, see him in full glory. It's completely chopped up, yeah. And then the main reveal, when it's, like, the close-up of, of the back of his head, and then he turns around, and you see the front of his face, and you're just like, it doesn't mean anything, because we just saw him in full view punch a guy. He's a guy in a sweater with a gun. Yes. Yeah, but even even so, like someone on YouTube did like a re-edit of the scene with just sound effects and without the stupid song. And it actually is a decent enough intro, in my no, opinion. No, I think so too. Okay, you know what would have been a better uh, song fit for this scene? You know the beginning of The Naked Gun, where he beats up all those international world leaders? Yeah. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah, that'd be fun. <laughs> That's Troy, I would ag I would agree with you, but you are fucking grounded for the rest of the episode. I don't Yeah. I'll tell God. Kevin. I'll tell Kevin you didn't like his movie. He still has a gun. 
It's like that scene in Silence of Andrew Garfield stepping on the Jesus. It's like, I can't do it. I can't, even, even at gunpoint, I can't uh, go against my belief that this is one of the worst fucking things I've ever heard. Gee, meanwhile, all. I'm Liam Neeson over here. I'm happy. You've embraced it. Yeah, you're, you're like, <laughs> Kevin's giving me nice food. He's giving me yeah, a Yeah, you've, uh, <laughs> it, like, and you only live twice instead of turning Japanese, you've gotten surgery to look like Kevin McClure. <laughs> I've, I've looked more Irish. Truly, it is my dream. We just eat crap and potatoes, and we think about <laughs> if Santa Claus is allowed in our airspace. Uh, and then we reveal that this is all just a training because montage. Because he gets stabbed yeah. by a woman. What, by, like, a Patty Hearst type? Yeah. Right. It's a Patty Hearst simulation, and Patty Hearst had been kidnapped by the Sandinistas. Yeah. We watched the whole scene play out on VHS and M's office. And it's been edited, and it got different angles. Yeah, they have different <laughs> angles, and it looks like dailies, film dailies. And we meet Edward Fox as M, who is such a fucking asshole. I hate him so <laughs> he much. He's the worst M it's... of all time. Almost by design, because... Yeah. They're trying to get some point of how this this guy is younger and is a lot more bureaucratic and doesn't put up with any of Bond's shenanigans and like always thinks he's like an asshole and a reprobate and he doesn't follow orders and he's too old and stuff like that. And he doesn't take care of his health. And he doesn't take care of his health. Too many free radicals. That's your problem. Free radicals, sir? Yeah, they're toxins that destroy the body and the brain. Caused by eating too much red meat and white bread and too many dry martinis. Then I shall cut out the white bread, sir. So, which yeah, is that, why that's funny that they clinic. give him like an actual order to go to the spot to like take care of. I was going to say the movie improves on Thunderball in that respect, <laughs> in that there's a very good reason why he's at the spot. I do agree. Right. I'm just going like, you're old and fat as shit. Go get in shape. Jesus Christ. It's disgusting <laughs> yeah. to see you. <laughs> and then Miss Money Penny meets him and she's like, I, I'm not going to hit on you. You're like my father's age. M Money Penny does have a moment where she hits on Connery because there's one part where he's like on the computer and then Bond goes like, shouldn't you be in bed, Mish Money Penny? And then she's like, shouldn't we both? You still here, Money Penny? You should be in bed. James, we both should be. And I'm like, oh. ah. Uh, and, and James <laughs> is like, knock it off. It's so fucking nothing. Like, all, all these equivalents to the Eon movies, all these equivalent characters are so bad. I think the thing with M also is, like, they probably tried to, like, switch up his personality with mm. Q. So, like, now Q is nice to Bond, and M is antagonistic to him. Yeah. But, but it's like, nice Ever about Fox that. does not do the Q thing good at all. <laughs> like, I like the, these changes for this legally distinct version of Bond, because you can have it, like, M is the new guy, and he doesn't put up with Bond shit, and the only solace that Bond has is with Q, who's the guy who makes all the weird gadgets that nobody can use anymore. I like how in the movie, Q is, like, left behind. That's very nice. I don't mind the changes per se, but the execution is dog shit. No, Edward Fox's line deliveries are like rapid fire. Just compare Edward Fox with Q from the from De to Desmond Llewellyn, you know, like Desmond Llewellyn does this thing so good of like being antagonistic to Bond, but there's still like a relationship there. It still feels like there's care between the two characters. Edward Fox just comes in and, and he's like a teenager. He's like, Ugh, lay off me, dad. And it's like, oh my God, you're supposed to be like the the leader of the MI6. But that's the point. You know, it's... Oh, I'll make you no secret. I hold your methods in much less regard than my illustrious predecessor did. I'd like to offer you lunch at my club. Oh, you'll do more than that, 007. No, caught you seducing his wife, did he? You study the plot more carefully. The dead. 007 dead. He's the kind of attitude that tempts me to suspend you, 007. In theory, not a bad idea. They do nothing with it. That's the problem. <laughs> yeah, he's just nagging at... And that throws... every, every, every time this motherfucker gets news about James Bond, he just goes like, Oh, it's like, <laughs> can, can we care a little bit here? Like... Anyway, so Bond is sent to the health clinic and he's driving a Bentley. Which is what he drives in the books. He drives a Bentley, not... Whoa! Mm, this is the real James Bond. And then Bond gets out of the car, and then the valet is just like, oh, nice car. 
And then Bond's like, yeah, they don't make them like they used to. My word, they don't make them like this anymore. Right. It's still in pretty good shape. Uh... All this is fine. So far, so good. You know, it's dealing with an older Bond. Where does this go? It's not, it's not terrible, but I will say like, during this whole spa scene, and I was thinking like, okay, like, yeah, I had like, for example, him lifting the weights and getting <laughs> trapped like that, you know, that makes more sense than the weird, like, yeah. stretching thing that in Thunderbolt. They heard your notes. They read the comments. <laughs> yeah, but, but at the same time, it's like, it has less of that weird personality that the early James Bond movies has. It's, it's like, it's just one of those movies, but like, dull and like it's with oddly no riz. grounded the whole movie is like oddly grounded where though? there aren't big secrets. until layers. they get to the waltz uh yes <laughs> well no but even the waltz happens in like a ballroom right there's no ken adam secret lair specter just meets in what like about an the office magic building. video game they play? yeah and there's the pen that makes people explode <laughs> yeah okay yeah there's things in the movie that aren't grounded but the physical locations they're in are all like office buildings and like Real life spas and Spectre meets in like an office, like a wood paneled room, much like the one Jan is oh, in the, right the, now. Oh, the, the replacing like, <laughs> your eye with the president's eye—that is like the most grounded and realistic thing. Oh wait, ever. while we're on the spa, since we are kind of going in order, I do want to bring up. Good job, Kevin. James Bond gets with the nurse more consensually in this one. We we did it. It's it's still sexual harassment, but yes. Yes, but we it's slightly better. <laughs> Yeah, he like shoves the foie gras into her mouth and she's just like not Oh yeah, wait, can it. we talk about how she gets him like health foods and he opens up his briefcase and it's like foie gras, absolute vodka, just I red almost meat. fucking puked. It's just traveling with like foie gras and prosciutto. It's just like Yeah, yeah no, yeah, and then caviar. And they're all like carved out in their own little spaces like a Yeah, like the, the, the smelliest, most putrid foods. He's just like carrying them in his suitcase. Maluga caviar. Quill's eggs, vodka, foie gras. You gotta ask, like, is that a meal? Is that a lunch for him? Or is that, like, it's he's gonna space lunch. it out? It's his box lunch, yes. He's at summer camp, and this is his box lunch. <laughs> it's his lunchable. <laughs> uh, I, enjoyed, I enjoyed that moment. I also enjoyed not the main nurse, but, like, the first nurse, where I... <laughs> I wrote down a few lines. First line I wrote down, uh, she asked, can you fill this beaker for me? And he says, from here? Like, <laughs> oh, the, what is he trying to fill it up with? Wait, yeah. wait, wait, but Paul, what are they asking him to well, fill up the beaker the, for, with? For urine, not for sperm. Um. <laughs> <laughs> so the sexual innuendo is like, I can pee like really 10 fun. feet bro no oh yeah it makes does, sense or his dick is so long that it could reach the end of the room <laughs> like uh no like no basketball. no yeah that's not the implication the implication is that he has a boner and when you have a boner you don't pee down the pee like goes up and <laughs> you know what i mean Jay, you can pee you in an angle of into this it arches. It arches. That's what it was. Jen all has about. a lot of experience with this. <laughs> anyway, so keep this in mind. This is this is Chekhov's jar of pee. Yes. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of like a Zack Snyder would take this cue in Batman v Superman. Kevin McClory invented peeing in a cup. Well, that's what he's doing right yeah. now. He's peeing in a cup, and it's and it's helping our plot. <laughs> I swear yes. to God, if that just sets up him throwing a cup full of his piss in Jake's face. Later on in the episode. That How comical crazy. would that be? Oh no, it's Sean Connery's boner piss. <laughs> and it's acid. <laughs> Jan, how did you do with biology in school? <laughs> okay, but that, well, I also want to note, yes, the, the rather than a stretching machine, he's lifting. It's like hundreds of pounds on there. It's, yeah. It looks very impressive, and then and then we yeah. get this fight. And I gotta say, look, I mean, most of the action I'm down with. Like Kurt this fight is, is good, yeah. He's yeah, I actually juice. did like this fight. The and time. it is hilarious um, when they Connery's performance. Like he really looks like a scared old man, like yeah. cowering in the corner. And yet he is doing a decent amount of the action himself. Yeah, yeah. he is. He's getting flung around. Uh, there's like that bit where. Um, he flings Connery like out of the room 
And then you see like a guy get up, but it's like the attendant that Pat Roach knocked out earlier. Mm-hmm. And it's like a fake out. And he throws him. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then there's the boxing match that the old people are watching. Oh, as yeah. They're the fighting. Uh, the that's great. other part that's really funny about all this is that he has this like gray, like sports tracksuit mm-hmm. and he looks like. Uh, Eddie Murphy and the Naughty Professor when he's exercising. <laughs> Wait, I'm imagining Eddie Murphy and the Naughty Professor. And I'm like, how, how, okay. If only, if only. But speaking of Sean Connery's physique, which he may be wearing a tracksuit right now, but don't worry, everyone. You get to see a lot of Sean as the movie progresses. Oh, yeah. Um, his physical trainer on this movie was. Drum roll, please. Oh, boy. Steven Seagal. Yes. Yeah. He broke his wrist. Yeah, he broke Sean Connery's wrist, and Sean Connery didn't find out until nine years later. That's that's why uh, Sean Connery in this movie, he's talking like, listen, all you motherfuckers, I'm coming. <laughs> it's why he's just running shirtless through the forest. <laughs> you know, Vladimir Putin has some great points to make, you know. Uh, Sean, can you can you stick to the script? I'm, I'm meeting up with the Prime Minister of Belarus right now. <laughs> yeah. L- Luk- Lukashenko, he, they call him a dictator, but I think he's a great, great man. Sean, please, just, just stick, <laughs> just stick I'm, to I'm the I'm from SNL. But look at his I carrots. Can't go back to Saturday he night grows night. such big carrots. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, he defeats the man with by finally in the coup de grace, he throws his cup of piss in his well, face. It's not immediately revealed what it is. No. When you first watch it, you're like, oh, he threw acid in his face because the guy goes. <laughs> and then he stumbles backwards and is stabbed by a bookshelf. With like beakers. Full of beakers. beakers. He's impaled on a beaker. And then James Bond Speaking turns the, the cup and it says James Bond's piss in it. And you're like, wait, was James Bond piss like, like, is he a bionic man? Like, why was no, it like I acid? Think he has so many STDs. Classic setup. Wait for it. Payoff. Payoff. <laughs> James Bond is a xenomorph. You can tell a writer produced this movie with that setup and that payoff. They oh, have yeah. respect for the well, written it's, word. Well, it is honestly, uh, I'm looking at you, Joss Whedon, Alien Resurrection. <laughs> yes. Well, we, you know who uh, Pat Roach is playing? What? That oh. character's supposed to be? That's He's credited as Lipe. Yeah, okay. Who's Lipe uh, again? Oh. Count Lipe was uh, the guy it, who uh, turns on the stretchy machine in Thunderball. Okay. The guy with the weird uh, gang mark on his hand. So is Lipe, is that the guy who Bond fights at the spa in the original movie? Or is he yeah. the guy he shoots with a harpoon? He's the guy who he fights at the spa in Thunderball. Uh. Wait, wait, can you tell me the guy he fights in the spa in Never Say Never Again is the same character as the guy he fights in the spa in Thunderball? But Pat Roach is like... He's the guy who played the big German guy in Raiders of the Lost Ark. He's nothing like Count Lipe in the original, which is weird. There you go. Well, maybe now this is also the time to mention, which is one of the fascinating things about this. Much of the crew, including the DP, Douglas mm-hmm. Slocomb, oh, yeah. shot in Indiana Raiders Jones. of the Lost Ark, came directly off Raiders onto this. So the kind of weird back and forth between these two franchises is fascinating for this these few years, right, where they're sort of well, in Well, you had Vic Armstrong, Douglas Schlegel, uh, Michael Moore. Yeah, no, all those guys working on one or more Indiana Jones movies. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, this. it's like uh, the mass line, but with uh, hack filmmakers doing adventure films. Um, I also wanted to ask, <laughs> um, so Paul, Thunderbolt is your favorite movie of all time, as we all know. Yeah. Um, how how was this for you? This being like a direct remake of your favorite movie. Um, I mean, I wasn't comparing them side by side. So some of the plot points, I'm like, well, did that happen? And was that? You know? <laughs> I don't remember this part. Now it was interesting. I mean, obviously on paper, Thunderball with with this murderer's row of talent sounds great. Uh, 
Uh, it, 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 <laughs> Your it silence was interesting speaks volumes. the way that um, the things that were different, right? Because it's not all, it's all my other hot take, I guess, is, you know, between Kirshner and Slocum, you get some really choppy scenes that were probably reshot and re-edited. And then you get some mm -hmm. like pseudo Spielbergian, like long takes, deep composition, you know, people coming in and out of doors around. Yeah, him, you get, you you get know, some nice shots, definitely. Which is interesting because it's just like, at this point, we've had 20 years of the Eon kind of house style. They've developed a certain right. thing. So it's interesting to see yeah. subtle ways in which they could be different. But to what effect? Nothing. <laughs> well. Nothing. Yes, yeah, servicing nothing. To the effect of a, a different mediocrity than we've been used to <laughs> for a few <laughs> movies. Um, yeah, well, we'll get to, I mean, obviously, there's not quite as much underwater stuff in this movie. But the underwater stuff we get. I like so there's some pretty good shark action. I mean, I've, I like it I've too, never but seen, I've never seen an over the shoulder shot from a shark's point of view before. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it when he just closes the door on the shark's yes, face. When they're when they were bonking yeah. on each other, like yeah. they're fighting. Yeah. Like, it's so cute. <laughs> like it's uh, like the little mermaid. Yeah, it's each like other. it's just like the over. That underwater stuff we're skipping, but that underwater stuff I think is emblematic of the aesthetic of this whole movie where it looks fairly consistent and grounded like it, something about it, it just doesn't look as like stagey you know even no. like the more polished bond movies still have some of that there's a sense of unreality oh and uh, you can tell more what's going on during those I, scenes which i like about the bond movies when we say the sets are more claustrophobic in this movie as well i feel like the rooms are smaller i feel eon no sean connery's just wide bigger spaces. <laughs> <laughs> It's 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 bigger Bond. It's like bigger Luke. <laughs> no, but, no, but Sean Connery's in pretty good shape in this movie. He's in a lot better shape than Diamonds Are Forever. <laughs> oh yeah, he. You see a lot of him in this. Movie. Uh, he's. Uh, I'll say he's more age appropriate. I will say though, his perform. This is not the Sean Connery from Goldfinger. This is the Sean Connery from Diamonds Are Forever. <laughs> Oh, yes. see, I think oh, it's yes. even further. Oh, yeah. I don't even think <laughs> he's, he's playing James Bond in this movie. This is Sean Connery on vacation with friends. Yeah. <laughs> Like, he's not even the character. It's very similar to the last time we saw him in which, like, checked he's out. very checked out, but he's not checked out in, like, You Only Live Twice where he doesn't want to be there. He's checked out, but he's like, okay, I guess I'll have a silly, goofy time with it. <laughs> See, because, no, when Sean Connery normally plays James Bond up to this in the Aeon, Aeon films, he realized there was a stoic nature to the character in parts. And sometimes he would deliberately underreact or like downplay things and you would have to like search his face. That's not what happens in this movie. In this movie, he's like, hi, Felix. Hi, Johnny English. Oh boy, <laughs> what's going on over here? Like he's just warm and happy and friendly oh, man. all the we time. We need to do a, a Johnny English episode for our Patreon. <laughs> oh God, yeah. I haven't seen Johnny English in a while. That was written Johnny by English Neil Pur Purvis and Robert Wade. So it's technically- oh. Yeah, it's technically oh an official Bond spoof. Well, can I talk about one change they made in Thunderball that I think is from the original book and I think works better? Instead of the weird NATO Domino's brother double thing, they just make Domino's brother addicted to heroin. And he's yeah, in the same I health agree. spa as James Bond. And they're using him. He's getting surgery to get Reagan's eye. And he will use Ronald Reagan's <laughs> eye yes. to, his, to steal his the new bloodshot Cronenbergian eye. Yeah. A more grounded Bond movie where a guy gets his eye transplanted so he can access nukes. Im imagine uh, the American public if Ronald Reagan came out and he had that fucking Oh, yeah. Eye. They really downplay how big his eye was. He was like, hello, uh, it's me, Ronald Reagan. Everything is fine. <laughs> I, do, I believe my heart and feelings tell me that I have a normal-sized eye, but the facts and medical records indicate otherwise. <laughs> so we have we almost have the the dynamic duo in this series because we got Margaret Thatcher a couple movies ago yeah. and now we have one organ of Reagan. Yeah. <laughs> we have the eye of Reagan. <laughs> That's what this movie should have been called, the eye of Reagan. And so once again, <laughs> the tears of Allah and the eyes of Reagan. <laughs> Ir Irving Kirshner directed the eyes of Laura Mars, so oh this is God. the eyes of Ronald Reagan. <laughs> <laughs> That, that that was one of the most baffling scenes to me is when they're talking about the tears of Allah and Sean Connery's like, it's called the tears of Allah because the story goes that the prophet cried in the well and everything. And I'm like, that's Allah not is not Connery. the prophet. That's, that's your next door neighbor. <laughs> like, 
remember like, that's no but at the at the end sean well ev ev multiple people give this story and they all get it like wrong it's like you didn't even look up what allah is hey sean <laughs> connery was in the wind and the lion where he authentically played a muslim warlord i think he may be did not know what he was talking also, about. Also, ironically, not we're talking about people who worked on Indiana Jones working on this movie. It's like this and Octopussy are looking to Indiana Jones because that's the oh, thing yeah. that they introduce is yeah. like the location of where he's going to put the second nuke is like this legendary location. Yeah, which I I mean, I, I guess it's another improvement from Thunderbolt. We have more yeah. of a evil layer thing, even though the climax kind of sucks. Thing. How do we feel? Do we want to talk about Max von Sydow's Spectre, the official Bofeld Inspector? What's there to talk about? He he does nothing. He's the, he's the worst Max one. Max von Sydow, one of the greatest actors of all time. He did Ingmar Bergman. He did Star Wars. He did Flash Gordon. He did Woody Allen. He made love to Ingmar Bergman? I mean, everyone else who acted in Ingmar Bergman's movies did. So yeah, so probably. Yeah, probably. Statistically, he probably made love to Ingmar Bergman at some point. Um, he was Jesus. And I'm like, oh yeah, he's going to be Blofeld. This is going to blow my fucking mind. And then no. He just is a He's beard, just there. And he's like, Spectre stands for S. <laughs> no. <laughs> Special Executive for Counterintelligence, Terrorism, Revenge, or, and Extortion. Nerd. Yeah. And he's like, <laughs> we're fulfilling two of the letters of our thing. We have accomplished two of the functions that the name Spectre embodies. Terror and extortion. If our demands are not met within seven days, we shall ruthlessly apply the third. Revenge. I don't. I don't even know. Yeah, I don't even know how to comment on this Blofeld. He has no presence, well, again, no it's, personality. It's, it's only there because Kevin McClory invented Blofeld. Yeah, and you really would think that if you're the only one who can use Blofeld, you would try to maybe give Blofeld a bigger part. But Kevin's like, well, no. they were hoping to make more of these afterward. With whom? With with Max von Sydow as Blofeld. But with Connery, no. <laughs> 70 year old connery that's what that's what kevin mcclory thought did he run that by sean wasn't part of the condition that he could have like so the plan was just to remake thunderball until he died basically well no in the 90s he got the rights to casino royale so they were going to remake thunderball and casino royale and they were going to switch off oh yeah but and we might talk about this later but wasn't he going to try to get timothy dalton no, he was trying to get Pierce Brosnan because yeah, he, he was trying to get Pierce Brosnan. Already been that whole okay, controversy right. with Pierce, but yeah, no, Spectre is kind of wasted, which kind of sucks because this was the only movie that could officially use Spectre. This is the one ace in the hole Kevin had. Yeah, and well, let's talk about the like that intro scene where we where we meet Fatima Blush and it's her feet. Oh <laughs> well, all right, guys, hot take. Fatima Blush almost saves this movie for me. I love Fatima Blush. Barbara Carrera is having the time of her life. The nurse will give baby his candy. Yeah, she's definitely she the most charismatic thing in this movie. Yeah. For sure. I love that character. Yeah. <laughs> I love her performance. I mean, Fiona she Volpe's all right. She loves being evil. Yeah, it's Fiona great. Volpe's all right, but she's not Fatima Blush, the like, most over-the-top like, if the crazy not Jessica Rabbit lady from Who Framed Roger Rabbit was evil, <laughs> yeah. she would be Fatima Blood. Just <laughs> over the top, running around, doing crazy nun. She kisses snakes Jesus! and wears them as a scarf. Yeah, I'm she's like when, he, when she's given the go ahead to kill Bond, she's like dancing down the stairs yeah, she, like, and letting her hair in loose. Her step. And is like running and dancing and her clothes yeah. are all on fire. And then when she's uh, messing with uh, Domino's brother, she's like beating the shit out of him oh, and yeah. then like kissing him and then giving yeah. him heroin. <laughs> she's, How she's... do you see the heroin is like this movie is like, we're not Eon. This isn't a kid's film. We're the gritty James Bond. And I'm like. Oh God, I kind of get why Bond's not gritty. This is uncomfortable. There, there's heroin in uh, For Your Eyes Only. Uh, oh, and Live and Let um, Die. The whole plot is yeah. about heroin. Both cautionary tales. Though. Both those movies are not good. Yeah, don't take heroin or you will end up like Topol. Is the message For Your Eyes Only. <laughs> you know, 
Topo is also in Flash Gordon. That's a great movie. That is. We should we should reveal that. We should watch. We should watch Flash with Gordon. Timothy Dalton. Yeah, with Timothy yes. Dalton and Max von Sydow as Ming the Merciless. It all comes out. and he's a great villain in that. And you know how much of the movie Ming is in? A lot. You know how much of the movie he's in here? Nothing. Can we talk about how Laura Santeca, Max von Sydow, was in a fucking Star Wars movie? And I'm like, who's he going to be? Is he going to be like the new emperor? No, he's just some guy who like knew Leia once, and then he gets killed in like Good. two Thank minutes. Thank God. When that happened, I was like, he he got a paycheck and then he didn't humiliate himself. That is objectively him. good. They could have used him. They could have, but no. this is not this is not never say never again, the triumph of Kevin that's McClory. That's right, that's right. Let's okay, get back right. on track here. Did you know Kevin McClory wrote the original story to The Force Awakens and they didn't use it? Kevin Kevin McClory wrote Star Wars, all of it. Kevin like, McClory, what are you talking about? He's, he's done a lot of screenwriting work under the name Michael Arndt. <laughs> <laughs> Did you know Kevin McClory wrote a good script for The Rise of Skywalker that he didn't use because he also wrote the Book of Henry? Uh-oh. But yeah, then we, we meet our villain, Klaus Maria Brandauer. Who's Largo, but he's young and sexy Largo. And Klaus... He dares to ask, what if Largo was a fuckboy? He's just a chill guy. He, he listens to beats. He, come, he yeah. comes into his boat and he, and he says hi to everybody. He says good Wait, morning. I'm gonna look it begs up. the question, what if your Bond villain was German Jack Black? <laughs> <laughs> what? Well, here's the that's, thing. That's also an interesting question. Klaus Maria Brandauer is one of the worst neighbors I've ever had, but he's one of my favorite actors. But in this movie, they clearly told him Channel Klaus Maria, not the great actor. Channel Klaus Maria, the shitty neighbor that <laughs> harasses people around him with his German music. I was going to say, all right, so I looked it up, and him and Camila Basinger, which is her real name, apparently. Camila. Uh, Kim Camila. Did you say Kim? Yeah, it's Kim Mila. It's yeah, K I M I L A. Why do we have to call her by her real name? Because <laughs> I just found out that was her real name 15 seconds ago, and I'm baffled by it. Like, what? I didn't know that. She is only 10 years younger than Claus, which makes, I don't know, like the whole point of Thunderball, again, it's Ian Fleming. It's an older man, James Bond, who is perpetually middle-aged, fighting for this baby woman that one of them owns and that James Bond steals from him. But in this movie, Bond's older than both of them by like 13, 23 years, and they're only 10 years apart. So, like, they're all kind of the same age, and, like, the whole movie's about the psychosexual love triangle, and it just feels weird, right? Well, the thing is, is that yes. they are, they kind of change it up, because they make it so that they hint at it, and then they backtrack the idea that Domino wants to be with Largo, because, you know, he's slightly older, but he's still young. Yeah. He's, uh, he's a billionaire, like, mogul who plays video games. And is youthful and energetic and Very shit. Cool. And acts Very like Jack cool. Black. Very hot. And he has his own ballet studio that he yeah. watches her do ballet in while he crunks like 80s rock. He's rock like a pre-Elon Musk, like a billionaire yeah, Redditor basically. who thinks he's awesome, but is like the dullest guy ever. Was Domino the Grimes of her time? Oh. Oh. But yeah, Troy, to answer your question, it does feel very uncomfortable. I, uh, this whole series is obviously incredibly pervy, but for some reason, the massage scene in this made me uh, fucking cringe. Like, I've never fucking... Well, we'll get to it later, oh, yeah, but we'll it was it. horrifying. Can we talk? Wait, real quick. So Domino is with Largo, and Largo is using her brother because of the heroin, but it's time to get rid of her brother. So how does Fiona Volpe... I mean, shit. Fatima Blush. Fatima Blush, come for on. For legal reasons. Different character. Different character. Uh, Fatima Blush, how does she kill him? <laughs> she, like, throws a snake into his yeah. car. Yep. And then he's like, ah! And then he, like, drives through a wall, crashes, and then she runs up and puts a little bomb in the car and then runs away and, like, and then, blows him up. The car flips a pretty good stunt. Yeah, the car flips I, I enjoyed it. Yep. I really like uh backtracking a little bit. I like when they look out the window with like night vision goggles and Sean Connery is like yeah. hiding in the shadows. And that's they figure <laughs> out. James Bond. Oh yes. Double O seven. 
Right, well, he has, I mean, again, yeah. Kirshner coming off of Star Wars, he's like, wait a minute, just turn up your goggles, and then there he is. <laughs> just imagine, like, you have, like, one of those doorbell cameras, and you see that image. It's, like, terrifying. <laughs> and he's, like, shirtless all the time, and you're like... <laughs> yeah. Sure. I see you have all the proper equipment. Okay, we're getting a little ahead of ourselves, but I don't, I don't know what that line means. You're obviously well equipped. Thank you, James. So are you. Thank you. You're marvelously well equipped. Chest hair, nipples. I like, like what, the, is, what is she um, talking about? I think Bond's talking to M, where he's like, is it possible he could have used a false eye to get into the thing? And they're like, oh, come on. <laughs> is it conceivable that he could have used a false eye? Oh, do come along, Bond. Let's think of a more logical explanation, shall we? That's you know, ridiculous. Where it's like, it's like, all these young people are like, real life is nothing like a James Bond movie, James Bond. And he's like, <laughs> sometimes I, I don't, I, I swear. Interesting point. Where does it lead? Nowhere. <laughs> this was racking my brain. Does, is this implying that like all the other silly James Bond adventures have already happened to this James Bond? Or is this just like a, a clean slate? I was wondering know. about that too, because we never really see him meet Blofeld, right? Which is kind of our gauge of like mm -hmm. where he is in his career is has he met Blofeld or not? Well, that's the weird thing about this movie is that it's supposed to be like, well, in theory, you have older James Bond an old evil that he has fought in the past with ridiculous gadgets and stuff has now resurgence and no one believes Bond that the world can be this ridiculous and that's why he's the only one who can fight these people. We have that movie. It's called Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. <laughs> oh. It sucks. oh, God. No, we, sucks. we don't have it but yet, Troy. Troy Stadamus has looked into the future. The <laughs> Dial of Destiny sucks balls and they shouldn't have made it. Sucks. Oh, no. Sucks. It's worse My than this My hopes are movie. trashed. Oh, Dial of Destiny is by far worse than this, yeah. Like, Kingdom of the Crystal Skull is Diamonds Are Forever, and it's better than Diamonds Are Forever. But Dial of Destiny is Never Say Never Again, oh my God. and it's worse. Guys, this is finally, this is the perfect opportunity to put an angry thumbnail of Kathleen Kennedy as the devil, and we'll oh get a God. million views. We did it! <laughs> oh my God, yeah. We did it! Yeah! yeah. yeah. Click bait, click bait, click this, bait. This episode's gonna be called James Bond Goes Woke. Ruined by Disney. <laughs> James Bond asked for consent, not my Bond. Also, he doesn't ask for we'll consent in parts of the movie. Millionaires. Okay, so anyway, my point being, that only works if Bond has already come up against Spectre in the past. Yeah. Which it's unclear in the movie. It's unclear. And it feels like this is the first time he's dealt with them, even though uh, Fatima Blush recognizes that that's James Bond. And that she knows he's had sex with many women. Yes, so. So this raises an interesting question. Uh, it's kind of like Hook, where all the famous stuff happened, but nobody seems to remember that it happened. And you're like, does anyone else remember that Peter Pan, like, was yeah. historical fact? James Bond needs to uh, tell M to remember the birth of his son so that M remembers. He needs to give M like a <laughs> bottle of scotch and, and he'll turn into Bernard. <laughs> so he starts slurring. He starts like, slurring his words again. Yeah, he's slurring his yeah. words. Like, Tokyo! I remember Tokyo! <laughs> I remember Tokyo! And morphs into Bernard Lee. <laughs> like, Welcome back, I found Miles. My happy You're thought. no longer I'll go. Instead of him, instead of him flying, he just starts hunching over and it yeah, becomes over. great. And the and the room starts tilting. <laughs> <laughs> but it's playing like the score for when Peter Pan becomes Peter Pan. That totally doesn't sound like Harry Potter. Anyway, because John Williams makes unique music yeah. for every assignment. It totally doesn't sound anyway. like at least 15 other John Williams <laughs> scores. The man just hey. works from uh -oh. scratch every time. Hey, I, li I like the score of Hook. I, and, and again, this leads to the most Republican aspect of this movie, which is that big Not him gunning down 15 Sandinistas at the beginning of No, the no, movie. not even the Islamophobia. It's the... <laughs> It's that the government does not work. Unlike in the Eon films, M is a freaking moron who needs to have a loose cannon, older guy, go into the basement. Right. Well, it was hilarious when, when the missiles get stolen. 
yeah. and then I don't know, was it, was it the UN or, or NATO or something? It's NATO. Yeah. It's yeah. NATO. NATO. They're, all, they're all arguing with each other in a room, and he's like, my God. The only way to the only way to quell this unrest is to call in the 007. Oh yeah, because <laughs> they, yeah. they, they don't a use sixty-five them year old. <laughs> this will reassure them. It's not like we disbanded this program for some reason. Yeah. I mean, right. the, the whole the uh, whole war in the Ukraine could have been avoided if, if they took some <laughs> of the old techniques. Just send in Sean Connery. Sean yeah, Connery, well, what dead. did you do? I I had sex with. Uh, the Kremlin. Vladimir Everyone Putin. Kremlin. And it's, a, <laughs> it's a decent segue to the other part of that, which is it, Q is not even named Q, is he? He's no, they Q, he's, he's called Q. He's Q yeah. Algernon. No, he's Algernon. Yeah. Okay. I've been saying. But he's, he yeah, but he's he's also called Q in the yeah, movie. Yeah, he's Algernon. also called Q. They call him Algie. Nice to know even old Q can surprise one of you double O's occasionally. Algernon. But again, he's like Toodles. He remembers James Bond as he was, and he's like, yes, please, Yes, he remembers sir. him as he was. Yeah. And, and, he's, and he's griping about not having enough funding and how he's going to move to America. Defect to the yeah. CIA. <laughs> uh, we're both humble servants of the crown, Alger. Well, if the CIA made me an offer, I'd be off like a shot. Unlimited resources, air conditioning, 28 flavors of ice cream in the restaurant. That's actually a nice scene between it, uh, it is Bond and Q. Touching. It's like these old relics... Who it's like, well, back in our time, we were able to go up against evil masterminds with ridiculous bases, and nobody knows how to do that anymore. And it's up to us to do that. And it's like that nice little camaraderie scene. Good to see you, Mr. Bond. Things have been awfully dull around here. Bureaucrats running the old place, everything done by the book. Can't make a decision unless the computer gives you the go-ahead. But again, where does that lead to? Nowhere, well, because it's just Thunderball. <laughs> The whole point yeah. of this is that, like, he's, like, saying, time for the old sex and violence again, James. Like, Well, no, what he says is, I wrote I wrote this down, he says, I hope we're going to have some gratuitous sex and violence. I hope we're going to have some gratuitous sex and violence. Well, I certainly hope so, too. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the best yeah. line. The it best line, line in the movie. <laughs> and so I hope, yeah, Algernon was watching what Fatima Blush was up to, and he's like, I need, James, can you do that to me? Can you, like beat me up and then I, I really I think that would have been improved if they both just turned and looked at the audience after he said that. Like just looked at us for a solid second. I hope so I hope so too and there's not really a lot of it. Oh I think I think this movie delivers on the sex because are we at not the okay, villains. Well we're almost to Sean Connery on yeah, the Yeah this was ass full nipple. Yeah uh, this one's pretty explicit. This is the only this is the first time we ever really see James Bond go at it. Right. Oh yeah, this is the first the time boat. we've seen like an actual like sex scene. Yeah, where he meets and it's like uh, the oldest he's <laughs> ever yeah. been. And it's just silly. They're just whoa. And it's whoa. so awkward with the boat. And then there's like the last part where they climax, and then the boat tilts and they fly to the end, and then it hard cuts and they're in, they drop into the ocean. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that yeah, old it's... scene with Fatima Blush, it's for, that's where the movie, I'm like, I can't defend this. I can't be a contrarian on this I, I, I did like that so scene. To... There you go. Okay. So. Okay. Jan, Jan, what? You're siding with Troy on this? <laughs> Wait. Yeah, how dare you? Wait so... a minute. <laughs> Wait a minute. Um, okay. But, well, before he gets on the but boat. But we skipped Rowan Atkinson. We did skip Rowan Atkinson. That's when Mr. Atkinson. Bean shows up. But right. he's in the Bahamas. He's uh, hitting on some lady that's just there. Who is Valerie Leon, who was the front desk receptionist in The Spy Who Loved Me. Oh, my oh. God. Another, yes. be another betrayal. Ah. Another betrayal. I'm sure she has deep gripes. But they're, <laughs> they're, you know, flirting. And then Mr. Bean shows up and he's like, Bond, Bond. Mr. Bond. I say Mr. Bond. And he's like, I think. James Bond. I think he's looking for you. So it's like, oh, she knows that he's James well, Bond. Well, she's the Martine Beswick character. She's a co-agent of his. Because she comes back later. Yeah, she comes back. I thought when, he, but he just yeah. brings him with her. Her brings her. No, no, with him. I believe she is the Martine Beswick character from Thunderball, the female agent who gets killed. I think. Well, are you talking about the waterbed is. kill lady? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. None of this is. shit matters. The only thing that matters in this scene is that 
They made the impossible. They made Mr. Bean not funny. Oh, yeah, that's another yeah. bad guy. It comes right the it's... fuck out of nowhere. He's doing, he's like the ambassador to, the British ambassador to Nassau or something like that. Yeah. And he's doing a funny voice and he's doing bits that aren't working and aren't appropriate for the movie. Like, it's just full on broad screwball antics that aren't even funny. Oh, I'm sorry. Like, even though they're saying James Bond repeatedly in this scene, he's not working. Sean Connery is not playing James Bond in this scene. He's just playing Sean a Connery guy who's is met Mr. out Bean. on vacation. He's just chilling, yeah. So when I watch this scene, I'm like, is this even a James Bond movie? This is this reminds <laughs> me of like Adam Sandler movies that take place at the beach where no yeah. one's acting. And it's like, oh, they they just they just swindled a studio to make them go on holiday. Except they shot this movie at the beach that makes you old. Uh, oh. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's actually pretty good. <laughs> uh, bitch. Uh, old. Wait, what was I going to say? I had one more point. And the saddest part of this scene is that Octopussy knocks this scene out of the park where VJ is using the James Bond theme to like signal to him in public. It's and true. And James Bond is like, yeah. hey, weird, wait a minute. Weird synchronicity where it's like, how is James Bond going to find his contact? Well, because he's famous. <laughs> yeah. No, I was, I was just, uh, I was thinking of VJ the whole time during this scene, and I was like, you'll never be him, Mr. You'll Bean. Never be get, him. <laughs> get out of here. Get out of here. You'll never be a professional tennis player turned actor. <laughs> there you go. So, we, yeah, we already talked about, like, the shark stuff, but they're exploring underwater. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with Fatima Blush. For no now... reason. He just joins her because... Oh, yeah, she's just like, I'm checking out some reefs. Yeah. And he's like, oh, right. and again, just like in Thunderball, he's not wearing the toupee for the underwater scenes, and <laughs> yeah. he looks very funny. <laughs> like, <laughs> no, 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 I think it is a toupee, because by this point, Connery was completely bald. Yeah, he was completely bald, Jan. If so that is a toupee. Blood, it has to be something. It's a pretty... I don't know, like, his hair definitely, it, there's hair reduction when he's There's hair reduction. Ex well, the no, underwater sure. toupees aren't as resilient. Yeah, he's, so he fights the shark. We've already talked about that. Earlier in that part, he hits on, like, a fisherwoman, and he goes like, oh, what are you planning on catching? And she's like, ah, oh, something about six foot two, 180 pounds with brown eyes. What are you hoping to catch? Something about six foot two, 190 pounds with brown eyes. But why bother going to see? Yeah, that's Valerie Leon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. No, exactly. And so after the shark bit, he finds a fishing line. And whose fishing line could it be? It's hers. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. so th and then he changes out of the scuba gear and into a pair of overalls <laughs> with oh. nothing underneath. He says, uh, yeah. he says a pretty good one liner. Uh, you know, uh, you said you'll catch me later. He did say you'd catch me later. <laughs> that made me smile. Uh, yeah. Then I saw him in overalls, and my smile completely disappeared. It's one of the weirdest. <laughs> no, and everybody's like cheering, and Fatima Blush is like, "Oh fuck, he just he isn't dead," because they caught like a like a two pound trout or something. Like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it looks like something out of Deliverance. They take a picture with it. <laughs> yeah, no, everybody's like cheering them on. Speaking of Deliverance, I've seen Zardoz multiple times, and. I am not phased by seeing Sean Connery in a diaper and bandoliers and a long ponytail, but seeing him in overalls, no matter how it's many times it's disturbing for no, some reason. Yeah, yeah, no, I don't like it either. Well, we get to see Connery put on a bunch of like weird things. Like he's in overalls, he's in his underwear at one point riding a no, bicycle. No, I thought about this. Like you never really see Roger Moore's arms or like George, like. Long sleeves are usually you know, the name of the game. You do kind of see Roger Moore's arms because I was I think was it I think it was Octopussy. I'm like Roger Moore's arms are very very tiny, <laughs> but like he never wears like a shirt that like accentuates. Them. Yeah, and Sean Connery he has this gorilla ish uh, yeah. physique, let's yeah. say. <laughs> so overalls do not go with him. It's like seeing uh, Peter Sellers dressed as. Well, Hitler, you know, <laughs> it's something that <laughs> and, uh, just yeah, as bad. like we've seen that before. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> a casino royale. Do, 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 do. The never bring it up again. Never say never to casino royale. Yeah, or that. Yeah. Or after today, those are done. Those are dead. No, bits. they're not done. <laughs> dead. I'm, this movie's burned into my psyche. Um. So James Bond is having sex with Valerie Leone at the hotel, and they get separate rooms. And Valerie yeah. Leone is not the receptionist this time. She's on the other side of the desk. And Fatima Bless is like listening to them, and then. <laughs> 
again, she puts she a bomb, up another bomb, and and you know that it's Bond's room because there's the bomb. This is actually a fun shot. Like yeah. the, the there's the bomb under the bed. She puts the bomb there, and then his shoes facing the camera. Yeah, mm. and then we keep cutting back when like Bond's having sex. Yes, another sex scene, ladies and gentlemen. Sean had something in his contract. Why is this the one with the most sex scenes? <laughs> Cuz they Sean Connery had input on the script. <laughs> yeah. That's that's what he kept rewriting. <laughs> He's like, "We need more writers." Gratuitous sex and violence. That's what Al exactly. asked for. He's, he's it doing is it funny for that Q. This is kind of the way it's structured. I'm like, was Peter Jackson watching this <laughs> because the Black Riders and the Fellowship of the Ring. What? Yeah, no, because it keeps cutting, because it's a fake out. Well, Peter Jackson sold that from Ralph Bakshi. Oh. We're talking about Sean Connery's tits. How is that at all like Lord No, we're talking about the bomb scene. Well, no, because it's like the Black Rider oh, scene where the Black that, okay. Riders are stabbing the beds, but it turns out they're not actually stabbing the beds. They're in a different room. That was taken from the Ralph Bakshi Lord of the Rings movie. He did it first. Okay. So for listeners at home, what this movie does is, yes, it turns out James Bond is having sex with Valerie Leon in her room, and his room <laughs> blows up and they can see it from the window, and then he goes, looks like we made the right decision. About what? Your place or mine? <laughs> <laughs> the other line I liked is when Mr. Bean calls him to tell him about nothing. Actually, no, it's, it's literally for no reason. He's just like, you want to go snorkeling tomorrow? If you're free tomorrow, why don't we go snorkeling? <laughs> yeah. I think I found a promising lead. Would you like to go snuckling? And he's just like, I don't have much time. And I like, I'd like to think that implies his elder bond is struggling with premature ejaculation. <laughs> like, I was I, also thinking of that because, like, you don't say no to Mr. Bean. <laughs> I mean, the whole movie is a Viagra ad, boy. You could put the Viagra Cialis bumper anywhere in this. It would, it would have been fun to actually see the ejaculation and then, like. His acid like burns her <laughs> from the inside. <laughs> That's why oh there's no God. James Bond Jr. So we're moving on from that. And now they're at a Nassau in a in a direct choice to go against the grain of Thunderball. They move out of Nassau and into France. And there he meets up with Bill and Ted's history teacher. Felix Leiter. Felix. I'm Felix Leiter. And look, maybe it's it's just because of, you know. Their concept of Felix has like he's actually kind of a badass in this. Yeah. And, and he shows yeah. up at this point in the movie. And it's Irving Kirshner. And I'm I i I'm like, he almost says, like, how you doing, you old pirate? <laughs> you know? <Yeah. laughs> Wait, no, that Felix isn't an Irving Kirshner. Felix is like a black no, guy. No, he's comparing, he's saying that Felix feels like Lando Calrissian in this movie. Oh. <laughs> Do you think we get the word Riz from Calrissian? Is that where that word comes from? To riz someone to up riz. is to cow rizian someone up. Um, Are we following the slang of the kids? I don't know. I'm what feeling you're very old this anymore. episode. So anyway, Bill and Ted's history teacher is Felix Leiter. Yeah, and he's yeah. great. He's the best Felix because he gets to do stuff instead of being a anonymous middle aged. The other, man. the other thing that's in this scene, there he's coming out of the airport. They're getting in his car. He's got like a. We don't see it yet, but he's got a motorcycle. And Felix asks him, what are you going to do with this bike? And he says, I don't know. And I won't know until I test it. Mm -hmm. And Felix says, it's going to be your ass, James. <laughs> and James Bond says, thank you. What are you going to do with this bike? I won't know until I test it. It's going to be your ass, James. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's one of those conversations that feels like a conversation that you have in a dream that makes sense in the moment. And when you wake up, you're like, what the fuck was that? <laughs> Kevin McClory. Yes. And then he breaks into massage Kim Basinger. Yeah. In the possibly the creepiest scene in Horrifying. any of the Bond movies, in any of the Sean Connery Bond movies. I could not watch it. Like I literally had to skip it is forward. It's deeply uncomfortable. Oh, and it, what makes it even worse, it's like, it's already bad enough. And then it gets to the part where she goes like, this feels good. And then Sean Connery's like touching her ass. And he's like, yes, it does. It feels so good. It certainly does. 
I'm like, no. Yeah, and then she's like, go lower. And he's like, oh, I'll go lower. And he starts massaging her. Because again, he's wearing this bulky sweater that makes it worse. She's naked. Yeah. He's, did you see when he lifts the towel and he like makes her? He's like checking out her ass as he's lifting the towel. <laughs> I don't know if you ever like, if you've ever taken like a photography course, like where's this going? Uh, they will show you like a picture of like a smooth surface and like a rocky surface oh. to <laughs> okay. compare and contrast different textures. This scene would be perfect for that exercise because it's Kim Basinger's like perfect smooth like <laughs> goddess body, and then like Sean Connery's like. <laughs> <laughs> Decaying old man, Careful. hairy Careful. hands. <laughs> His milkman hands. <laughs> His, mil <laughs> His milkman hands. Yeah, you can you can tell uh, this man has been around tools in the past. Oh, his brother's tools that he stole. <laughs> he stole. Justice he stole. for Neil. <laughs> but no, yeah, he he's hitting on Domino. Um, he's sneaking in and hitting on Domino, trying to learn more. about about her to try to get close to Largo. And then when he's done, he just walks away and the woman who was supposed to do it comes in and she's like, where did the man go? And the woman's like, no, he doesn't work here. It's just me. Where'd the monsieur go? Who? The man I passed? He does not work here. And then it zooms in and she's horrified. She's horrified. And that, <laughs> that face of horror turns to a smile and it's, you're just like, and it's playing ridic the fucking ridiculous score. And you're yeah. just like, and you're like what the fuck is this? Ugh. I felt violated just by watching yeah, no, it. It was like, <laughs> like cinematically, Irvin Kirshner is telling us we should feel violated. The only thing that is keeping us from feeling that is that Kim Basinger smiles at the end. But it takes so it. long for well, her to yeah, smile. You, can, you yeah. can imagine them on set trying to be like, well, this is, this is not ending on a good note. What if she has it uh, we have to see her process and make peace with the information somehow <laughs> yeah they're like how long it'll take a while it's like Couple something beeps. that's something that is clearly not in the yeah. script and it's like uh hmm is that, i don't i don't think anyone in that span of time has gone from like I was assaulted to, oh, well, he's a little yeah, rascal. Yeah, it's bad. I, it should be said Kim Kimala did not enjoy her time on the set and she hated Irving Kirshner. Which is very similar to Nancy Allen on RoboCop 2, I believe. Uh, well, yeah, well, I guess we didn't mention, like, this was kind of her first big movie, right? Yeah, this was. Uh, this is a couple years before Batman. What what a break. We still haven't talked much about her, but... Um, uh, Kim Basinger. About Kim Basinger. I, think she, I think she's good. I think she's directed badly at some scenes. I don't think she's good in this at all. See, my <laughs> like, issue is, unfortunately, when I first did my walkthrough of the James Bond movies, Domino is my favorite Bond girl because Claudine Auger is just... Uh. But uh, watching the Thunderball again and watching Never Say Never Again, I don't know if you can make the Domino character work. It It's kind of a nothing character who's... Well, I was kind of saying this earlier. They're trying to change it up to making the relationship more of a relationship but then they also backpedal and go like no she's also kind of kept yeah at the same time which weird. makes it weird and you're not so sure how to feel about that and kim basinger sometimes has like moments where she's actually like conversing with largo and it feels real but then the situation that she's in kind of feels like unclear and not directed well because <laughs> because there's some line deliveries where uh, kim basinger does when she's talking to Largo where she's like it feels like she's actually having a conversation with her significant other but then she has to pull back and go like oh no I don't know if I'm in a relationship and I'm a loving relationship or if I'm being held prisoner yeah I'm not <sighs> sure yeah I feel like by trying to give her more of a relationship with Largo uh they diminished the relationship that she could have had with James Bond, which is kind of non-existent. Uh, interesting. In <laughs> I thought this was the most you ever see Sean Connery try with a love interest in any of these movies. And all the other movies, he's like, you're here? We'll have sex. But in this movie, he's like, I've waited years to kiss you. Dance with me. Or something, and it's nice. No, like, he, he says he says that. that, that yeah, no, I'm, I'm like, on Jan's side with that. I'm yeah. not sure. Like it still feels very fuck boy. I mean, I still maintain <laughs> Sean Connery is like the least. Well, who's the least romantic James Bond? Is it him or Dalton? 
I think it might be Connor. No, Dalton, I think, is a sweetie pie. Yeah, Dalton, Dalton's Dalton is very emotions. sweet to Kara. Yeah. You know, like he, he I, I think Dalton's a, like he's he takes his job seriously, but with the ladies, he's very nice to. You know. Yeah, so I would agree Connery is the least attractive, uh, least romantic. James I think Bond. the only bonds that I could call romantic are Craig and Lazenby, but well, I, I haven't seen the time. More can. Are you, are you fucking kidding at times. me? <laughs> A woman. Jan, did you not get my newsletter on the spy who loved me and Octopussy? Did you not get the newsletter? Well, the problem, as as we've discussed, the problem with Moore is when he's trying, the, either the script is making him behave like a psychopath or or he's cast with... A <laughs> plank of wood. Of wood. Yeah. yeah. Hey, we haven't gotten to Pierce Brosnan yet. That's actually my issue with Pierce Brosnan is I feel like when he tries to be romantic, he sounds like a tech. Ah, uh, now the romance with Electra is good, but that's another story. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll get to that. Um, what are we talking about again? <laughs> Where are we at in the movie? Are we at the arcade? The yeah, we're at. The, he becomes a gamer. Ah, uh, this yeah. is so tacky. <laughs> they put him back in the tuxedo, it's so weird. and then we go into a fancy Parisian hall, and it's just rows and rows of arcade games, and that's when you're like, this is stupid. This is so up. out of step. Conceptually, I understand what they're trying to do, but this is a lot like uh, Sean Levy directing Free Guy. Exactly. <laughs> we're just Sean like, Levy okay, movie. you don't understand the thing that you're making a movie about <laughs> at all. <laughs> I don't understand the thing that they're making the movie about. I have no idea what the game was. <laughs> like, it's just like random colors on the screen. Well, it's just like, yeah, no, now they don't play Baccarat, you know, Sherman Defer or poker or whatever. Now they play like this electroshock billion dollar game about yeah, nukes. They get taste in the balls. Give me a shock. Yeah, it's when he gets taste yeah. in the balls. But really quick, all the arcade cabinets that they're playing, they're all actual Atari game cabinets. And this was the yep. same time E.T. the extraterrestrial like destroyed the video game industry. And this is when Warner Brothers yeah. still owned Atari, yeah. I think. So all great business decisions in <laughs> that didn't end up in disaster. I love the idea that this is the last time Sean Connery ever played this character <laughs> on screen. And it's it's like 10 minutes of him just like silently gaming. <laughs> like, it's like watching a Twitch stream. <laughs> the worst part of this is that the last time he ever says Bond, James Bond, he's leaning on a arcade cabinet while Kim Basinger is focused. I'm like her little toggles and I'm like, Oh yeah. Uh, also, this was the perfect opportunity for him to redeem his Bond, James Bond from last time. My name is Bond. James Bond. Fucks it up again. <laughs> like, yeah, he no, just, he's just like, does not care. My name is Bond, James Bond. He says his name like he's not sure what his name is. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Connery? Maybe he did so. it. it. Like, it, he was coming to set up another movie and he's like, I'm a, the, uh, Bond. yeah, this is the James Bond one. James yeah. Bond. My name is Malone. I mean, fuck. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, my name is the name my my name of the rose. <laughs> like, <laughs> I do want to. Oh, I do want to see that movie actually. I, I do want to see. It oh too. yeah, good book too. Uh, but um, anyways, anyway, but I wanted to point out that when they play the game, uh, it's weird and convoluted, and they're both yeah. like trying to kind of vibrate while they get shocked, which is funny. Also, <laughs> well, the like, game is confusing. It's like Risk, where, but it's like just whoever shoots the most squares first gets a country. The game is called Domination. We will be fighting for this demonstration. I will choose Perhaps I didn't explain. Target area. There's a laser beam. Perhaps I didn't explain. 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 Perhaps I Oh, and also whoever doesn't get nuked first, and then you have a shield yes, that it's, it's like and an Bond aperture. shield looks like the gun barrel. Yeah. So yeah. I thought the twist was gonna be that James Bond didn't know that this was actually happening in real life. Like they're nuking the actual people. countries. <laughs> <laughs> and he goes outside and like uh, Spain is destroyed. France yeah, exactly. And it would take it into that direction of like Bond uh, being like, These, this monster made me do it. But no, they're literally just playing Risk. <laughs> no, they're playing Risk, but they put like buzzers in it. Yeah, it's, it's Battleship combined with Risk. Yeah, as Jan was pointing out, Sean Connery, 10 minutes, he's locked in with the lead guy from Mephisto, 
and they're like moving controls and going, ow! And and the computer's like, 50% voltage! Danger! Danger, James Bond! Danger. Red pain level, 80%. Danger. Danger. 50%. And then Kim Basinger's like, stop, James! If you play again, you'll die! Die. And he's like... <laughs> you're like 100 years old. You can't take that. <laughs> you can't. You can't. Your raps are too bad. Your woman's too bad. You can't They'll kill you. You. <laughs> He'll kill you. You know those Twitch streamers that basically like don't do or say anything. They just sit there and play a video game and people pay to watch that. That's how I felt watching this scene. He's just sitting there. He's silently playing. And I was half expecting him to like go get a go to the bathroom or go eat and just like the <laughs> the <laughs> camera stays on the empty chair and then he comes back and he starts yelling at his chat or something. <laughs> but no, and, and then he comes back and he's like, "What about the rest of the world, Largo?" And can we play like, one more can... game for the rest of the world? Can we play one more game for the rest of the world? You can try, but I'm the greatest gamer to ever live, James Bond. And he's like, <laughs> not today. And then he becomes the greatest gamer ever. In known. theory, it's like it, the, the basic idea is just like, yeah, you know, you have James Bond confronting with uh, confronting the villain with this new technology thing that he's out of step for. And then he's knocked down. And then it's like a Rocky movie where it's like he's down, but he's not out. He's going to end up on top. And you kind of have that like jolt of. Oh, he 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 lost really badly, but he's gonna come back and beat the shit out of him. And it kind of has that feeling, but then at the same time, this is mostly Sean Connery awkwardly sitting, moving a joystick around. Yeah. So it's just it's bizarre. It's bizarre to say the oh, least. Oh no, Gra Grandpa is trying to learn how to play Atari. <laughs> yeah. And again, he's tough. Because he never lets go of the controllers, because if you let go of the controllers, you forfeit. So he never lets go. But then at the end, when he's nuking the whole world, that's when Largo's like, because ah! he knows he'll <laughs> die. James Bond will kill him if he keeps gaming this hard. Yeah. And, and then... so uh, Largo offers him like a hundred million dollars. But then he's like, instead of that, let me dance with uh, Domino. And then you have this whole choreographed tango dun, scene. Dun, 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 it it kind of reminded dun, me. Dun, did you guys ever play Spy Fox? No. No. It, it <laughs> reminded me of Dracula Dead and Loving It, is it what it was. Okay, <laughs> Dracula Dead and Loving It. I was like, the good version of this scene is Batman Returns. With Bruce Wayne and, and Catwoman, that's the good scene. But, yeah, yeah. but it feels like it feels like a cartoon at this point. It feels like yeah. Spy Fox. There's a scene in Spy Fox where he has to dance uh, the tango with a with a Russian blue. Or her name is Russian blue, but she's a cat. And uh, if she hears the tango, she'll start like dancing uncontrollably to the tango. And he has to plant a tracker bug in her purse. And it's like ridiculous with the moves, like. Da -da 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 and that's what the scene is. It's cartoony and ridiculous with the with seeing Sean Connery like twirl and shoot his arm out like this. Yeah. It's just like, wow, this is kind of surreal to look at. Bold, <laughs> bold move of like our, our James Bond is nearly 60 years old. Uh, he should dance him this one. Still, <laughs> still younger than Roger Moore. He's already doing a lot of physical stuff in this movie. Like a lot, you know, like he's getting thrown around by Pat Roach. He's like climbing up phone towers and shit. Yeah. He's wearing overalls. He's wearing overalls. It's They're not doing the a lot physical of... stuff that Sean's bad at in this movie, I think. No. He really is just giving a crap about what's happening in front of him. But him dancing a choreographed tango with Kim Basinger is a surreal image to see, especially when he's in the Bond tuxedo. Because everyone thinks of Sean Connery as being more serious than Roger Moore, but in the space of like 20 minutes from when he went to that video game cabinet to when he's tangoing across the screen, he's already done like, like that's almost more ridiculous than anything Roger Moore did during his whole tenure. Is like well, yeah, the, and, the, and the movie itself also takes such a hard shift into complete nonsense. <laughs> yes, they're just like, okay. Oh, and then this is where he reveals that her brother was killed by Largo and she has to dance. Your brother's dead. Keep dancing. Largo keeps saying, oh, your brother's flight got delayed. And he's been saying this for like weeks. I'm going to pick up Jack. No, that's not possible. Jack phoned earlier to say he'd been delayed again, at least for another week, maybe two. <laughs> he's still at the airport. He's still at the airport. 
<laughs> oh, oh no, they forgot to pick him up. He had to fly back. <laughs> Maybe he said Tom Bradley in ALX, am I right? Oh. Oh, I've actually oh. never had a problem getting on my plane at LAX. It, it's always been very sufficient for me. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I flew on Southwest during a winter storm. That was not fun. No, wait, you had a winter storm at LAX? Uh, no, it was uh, when Southwest went completely down. But they gave me 30,000 points. That was cool. Oh, that's cool. Uh, yeah, I once had an issue where I didn't, I tried to fly into Houston, I think, or Dallas, Fort Worth, and there was a rainstorm localized entirely over that airport. So we circled the airport for two hours, and then they sent us to San Antonio. And then I argued with an airlines of an American nature that I shall not name, and then they gave me a voucher, and then they fucked up the voucher, and uh, they took it away from me. And then I just went to the Alamo and got drunk. Okay, okay, I'm gonna stop you guys. We got, we, we got to keep going. Kevin McClory is in the bathroom. Well, he might still be shitting. He might be wiping as we speak. So we got to get through this. <laughs> Thank God you're stopping us because I was about to make the joke like, yeah, I was once about to take a flight to New York in 2001. And I was like, no. <laughs> well, you just said it. <laughs> you just Thank said God it. you didn't make the joke. God. Oh, boy. Thank God. Thank God that's. I, I did. Oh, I was gonna, but I did it. Back to take the save the day. <laughs> Thank God guys, you did. We got to be classy. We're not the Neds Declassified podcast <laughs> yeah oh troy we should tell the audience about that one time i gave you a blow job uh <laughs> oh but you and the I whole saw that, cast actually. of that show that. did that you were going crazy jan and you were only like we, 75 we... years old <laughs> all right yeah we have all blown troy into oblivion come on <laughs> yeah, and somehow they won't join my cult I think I hear the, the whole toilet paper point being the cult. unrolled right now. Oh, we, shit, need we need to, to get on track. We need, we need to keep going. <laughs> we need to get on track. He's been there for a while. No, he has. He ate a bunch of Taco Bell for some reason. He kept complaining about his prostate. Okay, so the bike chase. Pretty yes. solid. Pretty sick. The best scene in the movie, for sure. He yeah. find, is Valerie Leon dead? Is that who he finds dead in the yes, house? Yes, he finds her in the water. I don't, I'm not sure if she's on top of the waterbed. Or she's inside the waterbed. I didn't know what I was But it's at. shot from inside the waterbed. Yeah. So she's dead. And then Fatima Plush is in hot pursuit. And then he gets the motorcycle chase. Which, again, in the great tragedy of Never Say Never Again, the motorcycle chase is really cool. Yeah. <laughs> and it's also plagued with terrible, terrible music. That sounds like... Yeah, <laughs> but then Michelle Legrand, ironically... <laughs> Do you think Michelle Legrand was paid off by, like, Albert Broccoli to just not come to work? To sabotage the movie. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's like he got knocked out, and then the guy who scored the room took over. <laughs> Michelle Legrand was actually, like, a communist, so maybe he saw James Bond as, like, he was an Smurf extension agent? of imperialism. <laughs> yeah, so he tried to sabotage it. Whether intentional or not, it's the worst score ever anyway, so yeah, it is, we have to live with it. If it's uh, non-intentional, fuck you. If it's intentional, I salute you, comrade Legrand. <laughs> oh, God. All right, so, uh, yeah. Oh, the freaking car crash, when, like, he has, like, the boosters, and he flies over the car. Oh. Oh, and yeah, then one car crashes into that other car and it does the flip in the air. All that shit's fun. And then he meets up with Fatima Blush inside uh, this weird catacomb thing. And we get, this might just be my favorite scene of Sean Connery as James Bond. <laughs> it is a good scene. This is almost enough to justify making the movie. This one scene. It's yeah. pretty great. Where Fatima Blush... Has Bond at gunpoint. He's just sitting on the ground. Has like the a, gun pointed at his dick. Well, yeah, because his legs are crossed and she's like, uncross your legs. And he's his old man legs. He's just like. <laughs> <laughs> it's like basic instinct. Like his balls like just drop off. <laughs> and fall out of his tuxedo. <laughs> <laughs> oh, James! <laughs> they just like hit the floor. Wayne Knight is like sweating all of a sudden. <laughs> and so uh, she's like, say I'm the best you ever had before you die. And then Bond's like, well, there was one girl in Philadelphia. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know that making love to Fatima was the greatest pleasure of your life? Well, to be perfectly honest, there was this girl in Philadelphia. Shut up! I am the best. Yes. Yes, you're right. But that that is the best piece of acting in the entire movie because he's genuinely, like you can see in his eyes, like remembering about it. 
And then when she gets angry, he gets like scared. (laughs) Whoa, hold, take it easy, man. No, it's It's almost like Irvin Kirshner like directed him going like, imagine you just met with like, uh, someone you fucked who also is like a weird, creepy James Bond fan. (laughs) Well, no, it's like, it's great because he's like, he's completely taking the shit out of her. It's kind of like Indiana Jones and the Cairo swordsman. If they had had sex like right before. And he's like, <laughs> he's like, oh yeah, she Maybe know, they did. I was, I'll put you as number one in my memoirs. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna put you in my memoirs as number one. And he's just doing different one-liners, and she's like, hmm, uh? Mm. <laughs> yeah. And then when he says memoirs, he's like, write it down. Write it down. Write it down right now. Right <laughs> down. Right. Are you right? Wrong. I, right. <laughs> and they're just like doing duck seeds and rabbit she throws each him other. like a piece of like toilet paper or something. He's got to like. Yeah, she throws him a piece of toilet paper. And she's like, I want you to write the greatest pleasure of my life was afforded to me on a boat in Nassau by Fatima Blush. <laughs> Signed James Bond, 007. And then Bond retorts, you know, it is against agency policy to give endorsements. <laughs> now write this. The greatest rapture in my life was afforded me on a boat in Nassau by Fatima Blush. Signed, James Bond, 007. Just remember, it's against service policy for agents to give out endorsements. Right! Classic. Oh my god. Great and then line. he's using the pen Q gave him, or did M give him this? Someone gave him No, a pen. Q gave him the pen. And it has a little Union Jack on it. Oh, which and is- Bernie Casey earlier makes a joke going like, oh, Algernon gave you one of those pens. Mine blew up in my face. I had the first one of those things and it blew up in my face. So there's like all this buildup of the gadget is not going to work. (laughs) Yeah. But this is his last hope. And he fires the pen. It goes into her, does nothing. She's about to shoot him. There's little sparklers like stuff, something coming from her chest. And she doesn't care. That gun is on him. (laughs) (laughs) No, it doesn't do anything at first. And then it starts to sparkle. And then she blows the fuck up. (laughs) She doesn't blow up. She gets disintegrated. <laughs> yeah, There's not a trace of her. Only her shoes. Like, annihilated. <laughs> annihilated. So violent. No, Squidward! Squidward! <laughs> yeah. First, the pen will go yeah. to your thighs, uh, and then you'll, and then blow, you'll up. blow up. <laughs> yeah, I remember my first, uh, first uh, pen. Uh, exploding pen. <laughs> pen. <laughs> and then, what does Connery say afterwards? He's like, prototype? <laughs> He's He's like, something oh, like that, yeah. And then and then uh, Felix later comes in and he goes, damn. He, and then Bond's like, how much did you see of this, Felix? He's like, I saw enough, but I figured you handled it. How long have you been here? Long enough. Long enough for what? To see how you handled the lady. You did rather well. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> what the fuck, Felix? <laughs> and then the cops are coming. They're like, come on, we got to escape this. And then they ditch their clothes. Uh, Bernie Casey is like doing a jogging box and Connery is on a bike in his underwear. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just just, just going back again. to Felix, I, I it just dawned on me that this is probably the most CIA Felix we've ever gotten of just like <laughs> letting other people do horrible things and being like, I was watching the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> I would have intervened if it got dangerous. <laughs> if anything bad but, but great job. <laughs> yeah. Much like the actual CIA, you never see this Felix on American soil. Mm. Mm. Um, so Bond and Felix investigate the not Disco Volante. It gets translated into its into English, the Flying Saucer. So they're just like, let's go to the Flying Saucer. Which sucks because they don't do the breakaway boat part, which is the whole reason why it's the, called. They don't breakaway. jettison a cocoon. Jettison cocoon. Uh, I so. know. Boo. Boo. So Ooh. Bond breaks into the boat. He slips through a thing inside the yacht, climbs up through a hole. Uh, this is a common theme also in the last half of this movie where Bond's clothes mysteriously vanish. Oh, yeah, no. <laughs> like, from shot just to naked shot. All the time. <laughs> yeah. Like, no, but his clothes, he's fully clothed in like one in like one shot. Then the next shot, his clothes are gone. <laughs> Oh yeah, there's a very big example of that coming up. But this one, yeah, he's on the boat and and Largo's just like, ah, you're here for lunch. (laughs) Yeah, no, the butler is just like, Mr. Bond, sir, right this way. (laughs) Like he gets caught, which is actually kind of a funny scene. But it's so like jarringly edited and it doesn't match from when he's climbing with the scuba gear (laughs) to when he climbs out. I had to rewind it 
again because I forgot about that. I'm like, oh my, wait, what? What happened in between these two yeah, shots? That would be fun if, if with every continuing shot, he just lost another piece of a tire <laughs> by, by the climax he's naked. Yeah. This is no exaggeration. This is what happens. Honestly, the editing of this movie is bad yeah. <laughs> throughout. You like, noticed. It is one of the, like, from scene to scene, like, you'll have, like, a group of scenes that should be put together and would make sense and you'd be more invested. You throw in, like, other stuff, like, in the middle of it for no reason whatsoever. Yeah. And then you have, like, continuity errors <laughs> up the wazoo or <laughs> just, like, why are his clothes gone now? <laughs> it is baffling That's, like you know continuity errors are usually like ah oh, he was wearing glasses and now he's not it's not like wait he wasn't naked <laughs> <laughs> now he's just naked from one shot to the next and, like the editing of this movie is just fucking just like in the beginning most of the problem is like we have one scene this scene shouldn't be here now we're on to the next scene now we're just getting into full-on bond is closed now he's not unclothed and this is the passage of time no no time has passed <laughs> Classic Scorsese continuity error. De Niro is dressed. De Niro is butt naked. <laughs> <laughs> We're, cut, We're cutting on him. It's almost like man. Oppenheimer. <laughs> yeah, Oppenheimer. <laughs> it's like Oppenheimer, <laughs> <laughs> but for no reason. <laughs> Did you or did you not board the Disco Volante? I did not. It was the flying saucer. <laughs> um, so Largo has this room besides Domino's dance studio where he watches her dance to crazy German techno rock music. Yes. And James Bond yeah. goes in there. This is, this is very accurate to the music that Klaus Maria Brandauer would play at 3 a.m. <laughs> so James Bond goes in to find Domino and he's like, I'm going to kiss you to get a reaction and also because I want to. I'm going to kiss you. I want you to respond as if you liked it. And I'm doing this for two very good reasons. One, because I'm hoping to provoke a reaction. And the other one? Because I always wanted to. And then they kiss and and Largo's like, Rawr! <laughs> And he just, he fucks up the joint, Citizen Kane yeah. style. And he breaks it's the, the German techno It's the only part where Largo is like an interesting villain. Yeah. You know, yeah. just making him like a jealous psychopath. You know, that's something at least a little bit new. And that's more interesting than in the other version where he's just a guy in an eye patch. But they don't really do anything with Because he psychopath. really, he fucking goes for it on the, when he's breaking yeah, shit. Yeah, he's breaking the techno rock. In theory, it's like this could be like a Professor Radigan situation where... You know, he's like this crazy psychopath, you know, like dressed to the nines, trying to keep the veneer of sanity and then slowly but surely just turns into a literal monster. <laughs> like the Duke and Moulin Rouge. Yeah, like the Duke and yeah. Moulin Rouge. He, I actually, the hairline is the same. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yet another masterpiece inspired by James Bond, by Kevin McClory. So the guy who plays the Duke and Moulin Rouge played Moriarty or M in League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. Do you ever think yes. there was a moment on the set of League of Extraordinary Gentlemen where Sean Connery was talking to M and in his mind, he's like, I'm still fucking doing this. <laughs> <laughs> Just like, what am I? And that's why he quit movies until yeah, Sir quit. Billy. I'm like, I can't talk to someone named M ever again. <laughs> that actually probably happened when he dubbed James Bond in like 2008 and he sounds like, kill me. <laughs> kill me. A dry martini. Shaken. Not stout. I need money. <laughs> For much with love. Yeah, yeah no, no, with with that was 2005, Jan. You weren't born. Yeah, yet. that was 2005. Yeah, I, I wasn't born that. yet. I, uh, <laughs> I'm barely 18. You don't remember the days <laughs> of 2005 legal. that Jan. 2005 was a Babylon. Ned's Declassified was filming. Uh, all these <laughs> things were happening. It was a wild time. And you had no Apparently idea. Apparently, the most sexually charged set of all time. Like the one show you don't like. When they started that podcast, I'm like, oh, good. They all stayed friends and seemed to be well adjusted. But as it's gone on, you're like, oh, my God, stop. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost like this podcast. Yeah. Anyway, the first, the, like this podcast. the first episode was like, remember when we had fun that day on set? The, the, the last episode is like, remember when we snorted cocaine out of Cookie's ass? <laughs> <laughs> that was given to us by SpongeBob himself. <laughs> oh my god <laughs> oh my god come on our podcast guys yeah no wait guests. that would be yeah, cool yeah, please actually do. wait do please come do. on our podcast we <laughs> love Devin, you Lindsay? you guys sound fun <laughs> yeah. yeah we we're big fans 
And you, you oddly seem similar to the characters you play, unlike us, who are all completely different people. We're, fiction, we're, we're invented by a writer. I don't act like this at all in my real life. I, I actually just go and drink when this is over and think about my dead wife. Oh, oh. she died? <laughs> what? Yeah, this was a while ago. Oh, I'm sorry <laughs> to hear that. <laughs> so anyway. when I mention my wife in this podcast, it's just to keep her memory. <laughs> oh my god. I imagine well, that she watches the movies with me. <laughs> the lore is getting deep now. We have Kevin McClory shitting in the next room, and now Jan has a dead wife. Wait, I laughed too hard. I have to do a disclaimer in that I'm friends with Jan's wife. I think no, you you She's were dead. friends with her. Oh, I was friends with her. That was always a rocky. <laughs> that was a rocky situation. Am I still friends with the building, the Lorenzo? That's only for the building to say. Um, uh, I can't. We can't speak for the building. So, are we at the fort? Yes. Yes, he's captured them. I think. Yeah. So point, that right? funny story. Speaking of my dead wife, um, I I just. <laughs> <laughs> I just went to the fort. This is like Borat. <laughs> Borat like, my, my dead wife. wife. She's my dead. beautiful dead wife. <laughs> so just last year, uh, I was in France with my beautiful dead wife, and we went to that exact same fort. It's Fort Carré in Antibes. Why? Because it's you're cool. such big Never Say Never Again fans. That's why. At the entrance of the fort. They have a giant Never Say Never Again poster. Oh, shit. The tour guide would not shut the fuck up about the movie. <laughs> He's oh, like, this no. is the part where they tie her up. And this is the part where, yeah. And everyone was like, this is the part where the horse jumped off a cliff. <laughs> yeah. And everyone was like, can, can you please talk about like the history of the fort? And like, we're tired of hearing of Sean Connery. But the fort is really cool. If you're ever in Antibes, highly recommended. You, you should have asked where the where the vultures are. Oh, the vultures. I did. The vultures are great. <laughs> I love that James Bond is in like the dungeon from Snow White. Like yeah. the skeleton. There's like something nice about the idea of it's just like, okay, now it's just like Bond's like in a dungeon with a vulture. <laughs> There's something like yeah. mythic. What you're getting to last week, uh, Troy, about the mythic Bond. Yes. There's something about that image. But then also... This has nothing to do with the rest of the movie. <laughs> no, this part of the movie goes, tries to go mythic, and then it goes, like, really Islamophobic. And unfortunately, yeah. that kind of ruins the mythic vibes for me. Because, like, while Bond is trying to escape this dungeon, is Largo trying to sell yes. Domino? Yes. And he's tied her to the it's stake. like an auction. Yeah. Yeah. To who is he trying to sell her to? Uh, to, I don't know. And I don't even know, like, yeah, they're, they're still in France, right? Like, what the No, fuck they're in North Africa. That's happening. supposed to be in North Africa. <laughs> okay, yeah. but that Ford definitely looks like European, like medieval Doesn't European. Matter. It's the, it's, yeah, and it's Sean North Connery Africa. looks like he has one foot in the it's grave. It's a cool location. Don't worry yeah. about appearances. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, no, uh, Largo reveals where the first bomb is, and it's under the president's feet. Bomb number one is right under the president's feet in Washington, D.C. Yeah. Which is very, that doesn't ex say anything. It's just like, where? Like, directly below he, the White he, House? He goes into the Oval Office with, with Ronald Reagan. It's like, Mr. President, I need to take your shoes off right now. <laughs> there are nukes on your feet. <laughs> and Reagan with his bloodshot eyes is like, what is going on? <laughs> My Whoa. huge right eye won't lie to me. But yeah, no, uh, uh, but when we were at the fort, Melissa was like, oh, we should watch this movie since <laughs> we, <laughs> since we just went to the location and that's what we did that night. And that's how she died. <laughs> <laughs> she actually I mean, spontaneously I'm sorry combusted loss, when Phantom of Blush, when Phantom of Blush <laughs> blew up. She spontaneously combusted. <laughs> and was just like, oh, I'll finish the movie. She just jumped out the window like the boss in the IT crowd. Yeah, wait. So Bond. So. Does Bond steal a gun during this break? Does he grab a gun and throw a oh, guy? Oh yeah, out no. The so he. Well, this is actually kind of cool. Where it feels like it's building up to something. Where Bond uses his laser watch to break out, and it's like close ups. Like, oh yeah, you thought he was out, but he's gonna come in to save the day. And it's 
a good hero building moment, but then they cut back to him busting out. Like they do an extra shot. I'm like, okay, you just needed like one of his hands, one of his feet. You're done. We get yeah. the idea. And then a guard comes in and looks and then the window has a giant laser hole <laughs> through it. And so the guy looks out the window and then Bond <laughs> throws him out. <laughs> I yeah, think. That's oh, great. but he doesn't get the gun there. Then he goes outside, disguises himself. I think he knocks out a guy and has a gun. And he never fires. Nobody ever fires a gun in the scene, ex- except for the end. Like as they're chasing him, they all have guns, but they keep using them as like bats. <laughs> You know? Yeah, and they're whacking and again, each other with it. This this could be a, a cool, funny scene, but the music's so bad. But the music's bad. The racism's bad. Yeah. Like okay, and then Bond is on his horse of conviction journey. He rides up and he freaking Tarkovsky's himself. Like, <laughs> have you seen Andrei <laughs> Rublev? Where yeah, like yeah, yeah, they I know throw the I horse and then about. the horse breaks its legs and then they had to shoot the horse like right I afterwards. I felt so bad for that horse just yeah. in the water like. <laughs> no, well before that we have two shitty looking special effects shots of like, it's like a comedic take close up of Sean Connery going like, whoa, and he looks like, and it's like really bad blue screen behind him. And then it's a really bad composite shot of Connery and Kim Basinger and the horse falling off the cliff and then cut to the water, real person, real woman, real horse falling (laughs) into the water below. And And you're like, like, Oh my God. Yeah. That, that horse could have died or he could have killed one of them. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, Well, this movie like had censorship problems in uh, great Britain because of that scene. Because they're just like, you fucking mistreated this horse. You pushed it off a cliff. <laughs> Oi, here, here in Bristol, horses are sacred, right? <laughs> horses are more human than us, all right? Horses are a mayor. Uh, uh, I, will, I will let you know, a, a prime minister's a horse, and he's a bloody damn good prime minister, if you ask me. Oh, shit. I think I heard a, f- I think I heard a first flush. Uh-oh. No, we got to keep going. No. So so uh, this is the point where Connery is fully clothed when he j- enters the water. And then when he comes out of the water, he is not wearing any clothes. Yeah, it's like, what happened? And Kim Basinger is fully clothed and she was wearing like a flimsy nighty, which. Yeah, she was wearing like a like... nightgown and Sean Connery is buck naked. <laughs> <laughs> Just imagine the script, the script supervisor being like, you know, he had clothes on, right? And Sean Connery's like, shut up. <laughs> I don't feel like being clothed today. I'm your producer. You want to get knocked off the call sheet? You son of a bitch. Fight me. And then it's like, okay. Yeah. And so, yeah, they get picked up by the sub. And who is the commanding officer on the sub? What's his name? Officer Peterson. Oh. oh. Yes. It, okay. It, it was you. It was me. I'm in the movie. That's a bad name for stupid people. Anyway, so we move on to uh, our very underwhelming Indiana Jones climax. No, before that, he tells M where the other bomb is. And then M over the phone goes like, oh, Bond, we found the bomb under the president's feet. Congratulations. Find the other one now. (laughs) The Washington bomb has been located and defused. Now, sir, from London, your chief wants to speak to you. This is M. We've cracked the code for disarming the warheads, but we've only got five hours to find the second bomb. And we're just like, wait, yeah. we're not going to see this? What the fuck does or that mean? Or it's not going to be... Because I, I was thinking like, oh, they're going to do like a tense thing where they found one of the bombs and they're going to intercut between them trying to just like Felix or something trying to disarm this bomb. Or like there's like some moment where they have to take care of that bomb. It's like, nope, already taken care of. Don't worry about it. There we go. I'll also note that they arrive at the Tears of Allah uh, temple or tomb or whatever it is by jetpack. Yes, yeah, I noticed that. And they it get looks shot very out similar. of missiles. This looks like this could be a real jetpack. I'm not sure. It could be, but it no, also the other jetpack was a real jetpack. Yeah. This is just bullshit. But Sean Connery <laughs> wasn't writing it. No. I don't think he's writing this one either. It's mostly a a, bl- a terrible blue screen effect. <laughs> yeah, you're right. But no, it is interesting because, yeah, that part's not in the Thunderball book, but Kevin McCory was still like, damn it, I need to We jet need pack a jetpack. If I'm going to do Thunderball. It's just like all the ocean stuff for me. It's like, is the ocean stuff, like the underwater shit cool? Yes. 
but at the same point, like, I feel like Thunderball is not a story that necessarily needs scuba diving. So it's yeah. like, you could have done something radically different with, like, we don't need the fucking scuba diving in this story. Well, they like, don't it's been do done. the scuba diving at first, but now they're in, like, an Indiana Jones hidden temple. And they get into a gunfight and a grenade fight with a live nuke right there. Yeah. You know, why not? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> we, it's not like a 15 minute underwater battle with no talking. However, the one thing that Thunderball did get right is that it made the final encounter between Largo and Bond take place on the boat. So you could see their faces and so you could see them actually handle each other and their faces aren't obscured by scuba gear. Which is interesting because Kevin McClory... In the book Thunderball, it is underwater. Like, the way the climax happens in Never Say Never Again is how it is in the original story. But you're right, Jake. When you adapt it to movies, it's nice to see. Yeah, when, it's, when, it's yeah, less James visual. When Bond's fighting a guy and then he gets harpooned, it's like, oh, oh, that was Largo. Oh, the movie's When over. I was a kid, I had no <laughs> idea that that was Largo who gets harpooned. Because you don't see his face. No, you don't. I finished rewatching the movie three hours ago. I reround. Six times, because I'm like, when did Largo die? <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> that was when me when I die? was a kid. I used to, like, be confused. For some reason, that got communicated to me well. Like, that's not what okay. I'm talking about. The climax. What, okay. what, uh... We all have something. Every scene, one of us is like, this is great. It's like, uh, yeah, truly revolutionary cinema. <laughs> My real problem with the climax is that um, it's just like, well, first of all, the evil layer, they just start shooting each other and it's not interesting at all. And then the fight is like two old bloated European people like fighting each other underwater, like super slowly. It's not interesting at all either. So the cold climax, just a big shrug. No one is color coded, so you can't tell anyone. About yeah, it. exactly. And I'm like, I, I can't tell. Another thing this climax is like, oh no, the up. bald man is fighting the other bald man. <laughs> <laughs> They're both wearing black. And you're also just like, how did Domino get here? I guess the army is with her, but why is she here? Well, she was on the sub because they, they messed I it know, up. I know, but why would Domino venture out there? They do the end scene before the fight where M's like, oh, Bond, I'll take you to lunch. I love you, James Bond. You're so great. You're doing so good on the mission. He's like, I have other plans with Domino. <laughs> yeah. And you know who's been forgotten this whole time? Is Mr. Bean. Yeah, he's coming back. So Bond is now, uh, he's having non-alcoholic cocktails in a hot tub with Kim Basinger. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, question. As long as we're, de we're debating his martinis, he talks about drinking martinis a lot in this movie, but he never says shaken, not stirred. Is yes. that a broccoli phrase? Could they not? I think can't legally is. say that, yeah. Okay. Because in the book, it's uh, uh, a vodka martini and a deep champagne goblet, three measures of Gordon's, one of vodka, half a measure of canela lamp, and shake it well until it's ice cold and add a thick slice of lemon peel, or a thin slice of lemon peel. Oh my god, Jake, you say, you sounded like possessed when you were saying a lot. Jake, I haven't heard you talk like that since I asked you what was in a Big Mac. Does he say that in every book? <laughs> no, he just says it in Casino Royale. Oh, but okay. he, he, usually he drinks like, well, in Casino Royale, that's like the drink that's focused on. And then most the of the Vesper. time it's just like a vodka martini. Yeah, the Vesper. Exactly. There's a whole section of how he got the name because he, he's like, your name is so interesting and weird. That's the name of my drink. Like, right when he first meets Vesper. <laughs> mm. Brilliant. Uh, but most of the time he drinks vodka martinis and bourbon. Back to a real writer, Mr. Bean. <laughs> yes. Uh, so Connery is like, this isn't a dry martini. And then uh, she's like, no, it isn't. And he's like, uh, new rules or a new chapter or whatever. I always have a martini at five. <laughs> You'll never give up your old habits, James. No, you're wrong. Those days are over. Aww. Are they at James Bond's house? Is this Skyfall? Are they swimming oh. at Skyfall? <laughs> they're, yeah, they're they're chilling with Albert Finney. He's <laughs> gonna... For some reason, Kevin McClory decides that Bond is going to retire in, in Jamaica at Ian Fleming's estate, even though he hates Ian Fleming. 
Well, to be <laughs> fair, every single person who worked on James Bond retired to Jamaica, I'm pretty sure. So it seems like a pretty good bet. There's something about seeing old Sean Connery in a hot tub that's so trashy for some reason. No, it really <laughs> yes. is trashy. And it's so weird to think he still would win like Sexiest Man Alive like five years after this. Oh my God. <laughs> Well, he was yeah. Indiana Jones' dad by that point. No, he won when he was Indiana Jones' dad, which is really funny. <laughs> <laughs> My God. Uh, but yeah, so there's there's a mysterious figure approaching. Right. And it turns out to be an unfunny gag with Mr. Bean. The end. Yeah. And then Mr. Bean's like, M wants you back into the service. He fears that the world is not safe without you. And Bond goes like, Never again. Never? And then we hear, Never Never, never say never, never again. Bond breaks winks? the fourth wall and winks to the camera. And then we zoom out Looney Tunes style. And in the iris, it turns out that it's the middle O of 007. Yeah. Movie ends. And, 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 it, and it did turn out to be never again. So yeah. the whole <laughs> ending is pointless. Well, until Information with Love, the video game. I think it's just begun. Yeah, the title came from James, from Sean Connery's wife at the time when he she gets said, a credit fine. yeah she gets a credit for the title because he said i'm never doing this again and then he's like fine i'll do it again and she's like never say never again and then kevin mccoy is like that's our title <laughs> it's like the fat four stick meme of uh, <laughs> mr fantastic I'm like say that again <laughs> yeah <laughs> say that again what am i some kind of never say never again <laughs> And now we've we've done it. Okay, uh, final thoughts and ratings. And guess what? We get to rate the toupee again! Yeah! Woo! The return of an old tradition. This is the end of Sean Connery? Oh, well. This is the end of the toupee. We really gotta make it count. Yeah, gotta make yeah. it count. Uh, who wants to go first? Troy. Yeah, fine. <laughs> All right, never say never again. I was really looking forward to this when I was first going through the Bond films. I really thought a movie with this pedigree. I didn't like Thunderball, but I'm like, maybe a second crack at it would fix it. And it's a very frustrating film. Because as, as you may have pointed out, there's a lot to love in this movie. You got Fatima Blush. You got Sean back in the saddle. You got Claus. You got a interesting take on Largo. And presumably other stuff. You got Bernie Casey. Um, but, like, it's so weird because, yes, for every good thing, there's a bad thing. And the tone is just fundamentally misconceived. This is James Bond outside of Eon, and it's just trash. It's just sex and violence with someone you feel should not be there anymore. Like, it's so weird to think because... <laughs> just die. <laughs> in the last 10 years, so much of our entertainment has been like, let's bring back this old thing from 30 years ago and bring everyone back and do it again. And it always feels wrong. And even here in the 80s, it's like, this is wrong. <laughs> this isn't James Bond anymore. This is Sean Connery in a suit. And while I'm glad the film was made that he got one more time in the saddle, I do love that final Iris out. And I do love the scene with Fatima Blush. So I guess I can't say that I hate that the film was made. This is the only Bond film I would say is interestingly bad. It's like, there's some interesting things to talk about here, but he went out on his worst film. He went out on his worst film. It is not an improvement on Thunderball. It is not better than Octopussy. Critics of the time. I see you, Siskel and Ebert, giving this three and a half out of four stars. What's the matter with you? <laughs> this... This movie just... I thought this was great, Roger. I, I... <laughs> <laughs> even if you enjoy moments of it, it just is off. The tone is off. And so even though there were moments I had fun, I cannot change my rating on it. I think I have to stay 3 out of 10, 1.5 out of 5. It's the worst Damn. Connery film. It's better than Casino Royale, and it is better than two of Roger Moore's films. So I guess I can give it that much credit, but... Kevin McClory, you're a effing hack, and you wasted your life on a stupid thing. Shh, shh, shut the fuck up. He's still in the bathroom. He's still. Well. I don't he, care. He, Keep he your voice down. He, I think he had to go back to his shit some more. So never say never again when it comes to Kevin <laughs> flushing. <laughs> anyway, I'm never, Irish, so never I can say you're him. done wiping again. Uh, toupee. What Kevin McClory did here was the most selfish 
thing an Irishman did that when Eamon de Valera did not ratify the Irish agreement with the British and led to the Irish Civil War. <laughs> anyway, um, the toupee. Um, you, it looks different. It looks very different than what we've come to before, but unlike Diamonds Are Forever, it has taken over the whole head. It looks like a consistent head of hair. Again, you have to ask yourself, is this the best we could have hoped for for Sean Connery at this point? And I think it was. Sean Connery in this movie is not creepy because he has a toupee. He's creepy because he insisted on all the sex scenes being way more explicit than they were in the Eon films, and it's horrible. Allegedly. I'm just assuming, based off what Kevin told us while he was tying Jake up and making us listen to the Ned's Declassified School Survival Guide podcast, he's a very creepy man. Is Kevin <laughs> Fascinating guy. And um, I'm giving the toupee an 8 out of 10. I think it's good. I think it does the job. Okay. Well, I guess I'll go. Um, <laughs> sure. This movie is Thunderball again, but without a lot of the riz and personality <laughs> and silliness that I like about that movie. Doesn't mean that the movie is completely worthless. As we've mentioned, it has great sequences. The chase sequence is amazing. Overall, all the action sequences are pretty damn good. And then it also has some stuff that is not pretty damn good. Like an entire like 20 minute chunk of the movie where he dances in games. <laughs> <laughs> but how can I not at least give some credit to a movie where James Bond, it's his last movie and he kills a guy with piss. Like, <laughs> it, God damn it. I'm kind of split on it. Not the worst thing ever. Definitely one of the most unnecessary movies of all time. And it's barely a movie. It's 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 a spy project. So I'm going to give it a 5 out of 10. Whoa! The toupee. This is, uh, here's where it gets interesting. So I am so confused why with... Uh, starting with Thunderball, actually. Mm -hmm. But... Solidify it in Diamonds Are Forever. The toupee stops being... It stops having volume and it stops being slid back. Now it's just like a flat, dead piece of roadkill on his fucking head. And it's extremely exemplified in this movie. Like, it's just... <laughs> it's just there. It's just a thing that's there. And it doesn't make him look cool at all. You know, it might have been cooler if he was just bald. Like, I, I honestly don't know. So I don't know. I, I was originally going to give it a, a zero, but because it's so <laughs> monumental and they really went there with the toupee, I think it, it, it wraps back around to being a 10. So, oh, wow. All yeah, right. 10 out of 10 for the toupee. Is this our first 10 for a toupee? No, I also gave a 10 uh, to uh, From Russia With Love. Oh, well, that was like just a little, that was a hair extension compared to this. <laughs> <laughs> Funny about that, I I agree with you it's a 10 out of 10, but I don't think it's like a like a dead rat. Dimes Are Forever is a dead rat where it just didn't feel like it blended well. Or that yeah, only looked the twice. Toupee. They don't blend well with his actual hair. And this time, it's gray, and it matches the grayness, and the thinning is fine because he is middle-aged now, so it works for me. I'm gonna give it also a ten. Fuck it. It's a it, it, the it's, haircut's so bad. The haircut works. It looks it looks fine. It's combed. It, you believe that it's uh, receding hair and it's combed well and it matches with the sides of his head. It works for me. It is incredibly impressive how much Sean Connery does look like James Bond in this movie. Yes, he looks great. He lo you, you think he looks great? Better than Indiana Jones. Did you see the Dial of Destiny? <laughs> He's not like, you know, showing his age. Like, he, he, like, it looks like the logical extension of like, okay, this is Bond from the 60s and this is what he looked like in the 80s when he's 50. As much as we joke about him, Sean Connery looks pretty great in this. Uh, the movie, however, Sean Connery is mostly not good in this movie. And yeah, I know that they were legally bound to make a remake of Thunderball, but they had, they started out the movie with an interesting proposition of, you know, what a lot of movies nowadays that Troy brought up uh, do is bring back a character, you know, after 30 years and give them one last ride in the saddle. And they set up, what would he be like if he had to work today and have to deal with this bureaucracy or some people who forget him and forget what Q is and like, 
evil villains that have ridiculous plans. And it's about how he comes back after being irrelevant and they figure out why he's still relevant. However, they lose sight of that in favor of just doing Thunderball because they set all this up, everything with M, Q and everything, and they just forget about it because they're so tied down to having to make this a Thunderball remake, which legally they could do, but they can also legally make this a different movie where Bond is old and still get away with it, probably within the round, the grounds of the lawsuit. So you have this really misshapen movie with fun sequences, like the first 40 minutes, I don't really have much of a problem with. It's more so the last half, with the exception of the motorcycle scene and Fatima Blush. <laughs> Love her. But other than that, this movie is kind of a boring turd. It's in one ear and out the other with the exception of those first 40 minutes. And it's the worst Sean Connery Bond movie. He's a no good. And there's a reason why the, the iconography of the James Bond <laughs> movies matters. Because without it, you're just kind of like, oh, well, it's just a generic piece of shit. There's, it doesn't have that, <laughs> that, that, that riz. If, it, if the first shot <laughs> isn't a gun barrel, then you realize that these movies are complete trash. <laughs> <laughs> No, Jake I did has not let say go that. of his false consciousness. He's, he has woken up to the truth. <laughs> no, I did. I I did not say that. <laughs> Jake, this whole podcast is an intervention for your love of these movies. We can't throw yeah. you another James Bond birthday party. These are very bad, Jake. <laughs> so they're not. They aren't bad. <laughs> they're fun. All right. <laughs> they're, they're fun. They're fun adventure movies. They're. And they have great stunts and stuff. But uh, so, yeah, I would give this movie two out of five. Paul. Uh, all right. I get the final word again. Ha ha. Uh, OK, so, well, I guess, first of all, to pay. Uh, it's pretty rough. I mean, part of Thank it is you. just like Connery had completely left behind this look long ago. So it's so weird having him be so iconic in movies made right around this time and it's not what he looks like at all in this movie he still looks pretty good and obviously he's in at least as good shape as roger moore was you know at the yeah. same time he's better he's in better shape than roger yeah moore. but the toupee looks really weird i mean i guess maybe the toupee doesn't look as uh maybe not as rough as times or forever but I think it fits that movie. <laughs> My the pleasures of diamonds are forever. That is definitely one of the one of the weakest of his toupees. So I'm gonna give that one like a three out of ten. Uh, the movie, you know, after 1967 and all the iconic times we had back then, I was hyped for another insane object of pop culture, some misshapen thing that would be endlessly fascinating. But it is uh, disappointingly normal. It's it's uh, Irvin it's Kirshner aggressively is, dull. Is very competent, and it is a murderer's row of people, and they are doing what they do. I mean, the score is weird, but um, the score is the worst thing ever. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Like, is it more outrageous than the bounce chicka wow and like live and let die or whatever? Yes. It, Yes, come on, <laughs> come on. That's a good score. It at least knows when to do the bounce. Wow, wow. This is just like I guess the timing of the scenes. Sure, I don't know, but yeah, it's just we brought this up a few times. But there was a recent film. All right, mask off moment. It might not actually be the year twenty twenty one right now. Wait, Paul, nah, what the fuck nah, are you nah, talking nah. about? This guy's all this bloody rocket. All right, I guess we're gonna have a Paul Stradamus moment. There was a movie. <laughs> that actually was completed, even despite my denial of its existence. It was called Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. And uh, it wasn't my favorite. And part of it was, <laughs> the thing about Indiana Jones is, at the end of the day, it is about Harrison Ford doing wacky set pieces. And the set mm. pieces were not wacky. And 95% of the time, it was not Harrison Ford doing them. It was CGI. <laughs> <laughs> so in my mind i was like this is a failure james bond Irvin kirshner is a little more wacky than james mangold i mean pretty much anybody's more wacky than james mangold yeah the dad <laughs> well, you're director. talking about ford v ferrari is the wackiest movie I ever know, i know and james bond has a few more components to it than just wacky set pieces even with as many legal restrictions as they had on this movie so they are very similar, but I would say this is more successful than Dial of Destiny, basically for those reasons. For sure. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, you can comp it to 
it's Thunderball, but it's the 80s. So it's like a total inversion of Diamonds Are Forever because that movie is like executed as hackery, but it's insane and, and wild. This is more polished and you're not into it. It's pretty much, it's still the formula because Thunderball is still tied enough to the fundamental formula that, I mean, yeah, at the end of the day, it's like if somebody recut this with the classic themes and I don't know, make up your own title sequence, you could pretend it's a neon production, you know? You could pretend it it's a ju- bad Bond movie. <laughs> well, sure. We've had plenty of those. Yeah, it's it's on the level of, like, Live and Let Die. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> uh, it's better than Live and Let Die. It's, it's, nah, I, I disagree. It's, it's, it's a similar, it's in a similar zone to, like, For Your Eyes Only for me. No, no I that's actually not agree. great if you're right. I actually that, agree. I used to have this movie and For Your Eyes Only about the same, and then I bumped For Your Eyes Only on the last rewatch because... I, I think For Your Eyes Only is a little bit better, but they're both, like, middle of the barrel blocks. That underwater scene in For Your Eyes Only blows all the underwater, all the underwater scenes in this movie out of the water the one where they're not actually underwater yes i know but it's fun. only still has better characters than never say never again uh maybe i mean never say never again attempts at being narratively ambitious but then doesn't and you're just kind of like well yeah and obviously yeah i mean i i guess it's interesting what you're saying jake but i them shouting out you're old which is what they do in like all of these because he's canonically old I wasn't like, oh, there was such promise, you know, in like another deconstruction of Bond or something like that, you know. So I, I'm not missing that uh, that opportunity. Number wise, I'm going to give it a four out of ten, I guess. Should interesting. I appear to be the lowest. One point I wanted to make that I forgot to make is it is interesting because comparing it to Octopussy, another movie that is very much maligned but works, is it's like how much of the James Bond project is about James Bond being cool. And I would argue that at the end of the day, you rather would want something like Octopussy, where James Bond dresses like a clown and does a Tarzan yell, like a moron. Uh, But it's all like narratively building somewhere and you care about what he's doing and you care about the mission he's trying to stop. And it's all like, you're on a journey with the character. You can have it's, both. It's, 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 yeah, no, that's really... my thing. I don't think it's one thing or the other at all. But then you have this movie, which doesn't care about that, and it's just about, look how cool Sean Connery is. It's like, yeah, the motorcycle thing's cool, and the punching's cool, but you don't care because it's not grounded in anything. Troy, I've, like... I've noticed this pattern that you just like these movies to be about something when it's fine if they're about nothing sometimes. No, but here's the trick. It's not, though. <laughs> this is Hitchcock class all over again. Ah, uh, yeah, but oh shit, is he is he coming back? I, I I hear the door opening. Well, wait before Kevin gets back. I just want to say, luckily the door is locked. He doesn't know how to open the door. Anyway, I was gonna say, yeah, it sucks that Sean Connery had such a crappy swan song. I can't imagine any James Bond having a worse final movie than Sean Connery did with Never Say Never Again. I sure hope I wouldn't have to view it because it would kill me. Yeah, and you would, and we would view that killing of you. Oh, yeah. great. Oh, shit. Oh, sh- oh shit. Oh, Kevin's sh- back. Uh, yeah. So, uh, Never Say Never Again. Uh, it was uh, the best movie I've ever seen. We loved it. Yeah, we all we, loved you, it. We were just, we're, not, we're, we're just talking amongst ourselves. It's not going in the podcast at all. Um, we're actually not recording right now. The rare consensus, 10 out of 10. Thank yeah. you, Kevin. Uh, what we did in the beginning was a dress rehearsal. The real podcast is coming up. We'll read everything that you've written to a T. You know, we just have to press this button record. You know, You're Kevin, right? I say never say never again is better than the field trip episode of Ned's Declassified. <laughs> you know, where he's running around in shorts. Kind of like Sean Connery. Never say never and again. And pressing the button. Now.